Hello everyone, Tim Manley here. Uh, John, are you here? <clears throat> uh, you are muted, I think. Um, let me see if uh, I can, oh, ask, move my co-host, my co-host, okay. How about now, can you see me? Yes, sir, okay, all right. All right. Good to go. Yeah, awesome. That's awesome. Is there a view that we can see both of us? Is it gallery view? Yeah, look at that. Okay, now, <laughs> now it's better. Okay. Well, but, but when you talk, I'll let you talk. <laughs> and then oh, I'll... I see. I see. Candy just joined. <laughs> Hi, Candy. <laughs> oh, Candy is here. Okay. So um, we still have about one minute. Okay, that, that's good. So for everybody who just joined, uh, this is the. Uh, meeting with uh, uh, John and me, myself, Tim and Lee here um, to talk about bear safety. Uh, we're going to share um, uh, a lot of stories. John is going to share his uh, expertise. Um, he has been a professional bear guide in the famous Kodiak bear. That's the place with the biggest bear in the world, biggest brown bear in the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we we'll talk more about that. Uh, yeah, and um, and then uh, we are also gonna talk a little bit about uh, photography and stuff like that. So, um, uh, if you guys can, uh, okay. So the first thing for everybody, if you can hear us, please type in the chat to say that I can hear you, please, <laughs> so that we know that the sound is uh, working perfectly. Wow, that means our microphones are working. That's a good thing. It's awesome. Okay, so the second question is, uh, please let oh, me know. Jerry's on there. Hi, Jerry. Okay, please let us know uh, where you are joining from. Yeah, anybody from? Oh, hi, Lydia. So Lydia's here with me too. So she's okay. Oh, yeah. In the background. Oh, hi. Also, the introduction. So that's uh, Lydia. <laughs> Lydia with and John right there. So. Oh, oh, look at the the um, location. So. Wow. Joplin, Missouri, Tucson. Wow. Okay, awesome, awesome. Hey, I saw Masha. Uh, Friday Harbor, that's a nice place. Yeah, okay, cool. Cool, so some of them are from the city, some of them, look at that, look at that. <laughs> There's somebody from Alaska too. Awesome. I see a lot of, uh, yeah, I see uh, Jerry's from Kodiak. I see a few people yeah. from Kodiak. Okay, right? oh, from Chicago. Virginia Beach. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So we have- Hi, Mario and John. <laughs> yeah. Our friends friends that we know from Kodiak. Or... Oh, nice, nice. Um, so uh, Winnipeg, oh God, wow. The polar bear country. Okay, so we, I see that we have um, 104. Okay, so let me try something. I may regret it later. Um, I'm gonna share this on Facebook um, so that people who can uh, join the Zoom will at least see that. But that one's not free, right? That one's a hundred dollar surcharge or something like that. Right? Oh, we should have, <laughs> dang it, okay. <laughs> so, okay, so go live so that people can also see it from the Facebook page. Uh, I hope that it doesn't just freeze us. Okay. Um, so we have uh, over 100 people at, um, joining. I think in the next few minutes, more people will join. So maybe we'll just wait for another minute or two, um, and then we will begin. Oh, okay, okay, got, got it. Some coffee. So thank you everybody um, to join us on a beautiful Sunday. Um, so uh, if you just joined, uh, this is Timely, um, and um, we have uh, John and uh, Lydia <laughs> here. Uh, yes. Okay. He's, cool. He's hiding um, in the background. <laughs> so John and Lydia are the the the, the bear team. <laughs> the both are the bear experts. <laughs> so I'll, I'll wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, okay. So. All right, so everybody uh, here already. So just another question. So let type in the chat. Uh, let me know if um, you have seen a bear in the wild and where did you see them? Just type in the chat as well so that we have an idea about um, how many people have seen one. Oh, okay. 
it's trying to okay <laughs> it, it is not probably not a good statistics because uh, people are, every not everybody are gonna type but uh, uh but if you haven't type no too so let me know that because right now it looks like in the comment everybody i've seen one yeah, <laughs> yeah. it looks like you guys are oh. also vibing as well so so we may not need this talk we are good <laughs> nice all right all so right Okay. Spooky Mountain. Okay, that's that's good. <laughs> okay. Well, after this talk, you know where to find the bears, and then you also will know how to safely photograph them. And um, so, so that's perfect for you, right? Okay. So some from the Lake Clark. Okay. All right. So with that said, okay, let's begin. Okay, John, are we good? Are we good? We're good. Okay. Cool. So. Um, um, welcome everybody uh, for this uh, special meeting. Uh, it's actually a very special day. <laughs> we didn't even plan about that. I, I was just talking to John um, a few days ago and we're just thinking about doing it and turn out that today is the day when John just got off from work and we did it and turn out today is the, the last day for the remembering bears uh, photo contest. We will send you guys the link there. So if you want to submit to that for some of you who don't know what remembering bears is is uh, uh, remembering wildlife is one of the most iconic and most impactful conservation efforts. Uh, uh, they have been doing a lot uh, of different animals, but now they are working on remembering bears. Um, and uh, and John and I both are very honored to have um, our photo included in the in the in the book. And the Kickstarter has another six days left. We will talk more about those details later. But just turn out that I, I didn't even realize that we still have a few days for the Kickstarter. And some of you have already purchased uh, uh, that uh, that book to support the conservation. So we are very thankful. Thankful. And indeed, John, maybe we can also talk a little bit about uh, what, 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 after five years, I mean, you basically, you, you grew up in Kodiak too, but after years of guiding, you probably will see what would be, uh, what the bears need, what, what, what how will, how can we help the bears basically. Um, but, but this is not the main topic for today, but I think a lot of people would be interested too. I just kind of come, come in mind. Uh, but anyways, uh, without just me talking and talking and talking, uh, welcome everybody again. Um, for some of you who just joined, let us type in the chat, let us know where you're calling from. Um, and then I'll give the stage to John and Lydia. John, so please uh, share with us, please introduce you. Please introduce. Well, <laughs> thanks, Jim, man. I grew up on Kodiak Island, like uh, a lot of other people. We were used to seeing bears, but not necessarily where we see them now. And that's closer to town, close to the airport, uh, on the road system. We usually found them when we were out hiking, camping, fishing on other parts of the island. And now uh, the bear is much more famous because when I was growing up, uh, the bear viewing just didn't exist other than the people that were out, you know, mm -hmm. running into bears hunting, camping, what, doing outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. Now, um, bear viewing is a iconic uh, thing to do and, and uh, something that I enjoy probably as much as the, the customers and the clients that come up because we get to teach them during that time about what bears are doing and how bears act among people and how uh, habituation with people also affects their behavior. So, mm -hmm. um, but I left Kodiak after high school, went up and got my education I now work as an aerospace engineer, and uh, I just returned to the States and Alaska uh, just yesterday. So, so um, you, so that that is a very interesting thing. Like, like how many people here in the chat um, grew up in Kodiak Island? <laughs> no, no, well, I think no. there's a few there. Really? Okay, so that's that's fascinating. But so you grew up there, and um, to some of us who have never been to Kodiak Island, ex at least for me, Kodiak Island feels like the island in the movie King Kong. <laughs> like you go into this wilderness, and then there's this gigantic biggest bear there. So how 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 was it like? And then I talked to a friend, and they said they you have, you can actually take a cab in Kodiak. So is it like very remote, or is it also a little bit civilized? <laughs> Do you want me to talk about that, or yeah. do you? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, well, we have a McDonald's, so. Yeah. Oh God, that that is not good. Okay. And we have we actually have one street light. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh it's the only traffic light that you can 
stop at in, in the town. And when we were growing up, it just didn't exist. It used to just blink okay. and they finally made it. So it is a, it is a, used to be, I think, uh, number one or two fishing capital of the world, or that was the claim. Mm -hmm. And so we have an active fishing fleet. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there used to be crab, Kodiak King crab was very famous, mm -hmm. shrimp, and now it's uh, a wide variety of fish. Mm -hmm. um, most of us grew up doing some sort of fishing or working in the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but you'll find it, it's, it's remote. It's a remote island, but it's very sophisticated. We have uh, most things that everybody else has in their home and we can live out off the grid or in the town and it, shopping and everything else is just like any place else in the world. I see. <clears throat> so I, I just want to interrupt. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so for all, all of you here, if you have a question, uh, you, you, you guys are familiar with the Zoom, right? So you see that there's a Q&A button there. So you are more than welcome to type your questions in the Q&A. And then after this uh, webinar, we, uh, we will go into the questions to answer you. So um, because in the chat, it may, we may lose the, um, like we, we couldn't see it. So, so the Q&A is where, where we'll <clears throat> you type in the question. So back to John. So you you mentioned that you have been a professional bear guide for five years. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. So how was it like? Um, in the sense of the difference between just doing it myself, watching and, and actually yeah. uh, uh, no, taking no. So, clients. So you you guide in Kodiak and uh, Katmai. So basically, yeah. people fly out and then and then they oh. meet you and then you bring them out, right? Well, I I guide it with other people or we we uh, would charter a flight and take people over. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is fly in a float plane either to the south, south end of the island. Um, uh, Fraser Lake is a real popular spot. There's a fishing uh, weir out there where they do a salmon count and it's a man-made um, weir, of course. So as a photographer, I don't enjoy it as much because you have the, the weir, but it's a great place to encounter uh, Kodiak bears uh, mm -hmm. in the wild and and uh, Katmai always, uh, the Katmai coast has always been more interesting to me uh -huh. because of the different types of terrain and the landscape is incredible by itself. If nothing else, the landscape is what brings you in and out of there. It's, it's incredible. Uh -huh. um, and the bears in the large uh, meadows and plains of Hallow or the, um, the landscape and geographic harbor uh -huh. uh, is, uh, there's nothing else like it in the world. Uh, and I like exploring some of the other coastal areas yeah. and the pilot I fly with is uh, mm -hmm. very good at getting us in and out. So Awesome. Awesome. So um, with that said, let's jump right into the, today's topic about <clears throat> bear safety. So let me just um, start to share a few slides before we let me tell you the, the whole story here. So let me share the screen. Let me know if you can see that screen here. Okay, so um, so John and I um, actually knew each other for a few years. Uh, we exchanged emails and stuff, but we met in Lake Clark National Park uh, last summer in September, and we were photographing bears in um, in Lake Clark. And that's really the time when I realized that um, he had so many years of experience in bear guiding. We, we got a lot of photos um, in Lake Clark. And during that trip, um, we were, um, he, I was so stunned by what he was telling me. Like every time when there is a bear showed up, he would tell me all the things that I should pay attention to, like the behavior, the eye contact, the little movements, and, and the prediction that he made uh, for the bears is every time it's like 100% right on. And I have been photographing bears for 10 years now, but I have never even heard somebody who talk, who understand bears behavior in such a depth. So, so anyway, so we, after five days of photographing, I learned a lot of those stuff. And you know, as, as what you can imagine, a bear guy is very confident, right? They, they know what they do and, and all that stuff. So they walk calmly and all. And then when we flew back from Lake Clark, uh, back to, um, uh, back to Anchorage, John and I, uh, John asked me to hike with uh, him and Lydia. And uh, so we hike in Anchorage to look for bears. And surprisingly, John and Lydia's, uh, what, what is not demeanor, but the, the, be, the behavior, what they do, were completely different from when, when he was in Lake Clark. He was 
like 100 times more careful. He was carrying the bear spray. Um, like basically, he was holding the bear spray on one hand, and then one hand he was holding a monopod uh, extender. And I was saying, is this like overreacting? Like this is completely different from what we do in Lake Clark. And John said, no, I, 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 there's, there's no joking when we are going in inland. And then uh, when, and then Lydia and John will be walking in the trails and they would be like smelling the scent of the bear. So oh, there's a bear here a few, few hours ago. Oh, there's a bear walking there. We gotta be very careful. Maybe we should back up. Maybe we should walk, not, not walk there. And we'll say, what happened, John? Like, this is completely different from, from, from coastal. And, and then he said, oh, Tinman, you, you, you didn't even know how many attacks that is happening in different areas. So then it opened up a whole world to me that all the a bear is not a bear, it's not a bear. They're all very <laughs> different. And, and then there's a lot of attacks and, and I, we will talk more in those details, like the, the, the killing uh, uh, that happened a few weeks ago and then last year and all these things suddenly just came together. And I realized how important it is for, for John to share his knowledge about bear safety. Because I imagine you go to Yellowstone, everybody were lining up in, in the traffic jam and then they were waiting for 399 and the bears and then after a while, you, you, you thought that, okay, like bears would, just, would be walking a, a, around the traffic jam and walk by and say, there's no danger. This is like nothing. The, the bear is just like another cow. <laughs> no, no, it's not, not like that. And, and the, the misconception will cause a lot of people to maybe go into the back country and hike. And then they didn't even pay attention. They said, oh, I forgot bear spray today. Maybe I'll bring it tomorrow and, and stuff like that. So that's why I want John to share with us like, for example, the difference between um, coastal brown bear and uh, inland bear. So, so coastal means uh, Katmai Coast, Kodiak, Lake Clark. Inland means um, bears in Denali National Park, in Anchorage, in Yellowstone, and in some of the inland areas. And like grizzly and Kodiak and even black bears. Like, like, I don't even know how to begin, but I'll let John let, tell us more about why. First, maybe, can you tell us why you are reacting very differently in Anchorage versus in, uh, in Lake Clark or Katmai? Well, it, the reason why you, you saw me change, uh, I guess you would say behavior, or, or I would use the word alertness, is because like the differences in bears, geographic area has a lot to determine with uh, the differences in the bears and interior grizzlies, uh, the black bears, their food source isn't as plentiful as the coastal browns or the Kodiaks. Kodiaks have uh, a plentiful uh, salmon, uh, grasses, berries, uh, lots of food sources. Interior grizz, limited. Um, the brown bears that in the area where we were at was, um, there have been attacks in that area in the past. We were dealing with uh, late in the season bears go into a transition mode later in the season as they start to pack on the weight before they hibernate or go to den. Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason why I was more alert is during that time, late, late fall, we have to worry about food source and especially an interior grizz. Uh, they don't have lots of salmon jumping around at them to, to eat and pack on big weight. Mm -hmm. And they're, they tend to be more protective of their food source. Mm -hmm. uh, also where we were at, there was fresh scat. So, and scat, for those who don't know, is bear poo. So um, it had been relatively fresh within an hour. So, and the tracks that we seen were fresher than that. So we, we knew there was a lot of bear activity in the area. Yeah. So um, I remember, um, so uh, for, for me, I'm kind of purely a photographer guy, uh, like, like not guide, but, but photography dude. <laughs> so I was think, always thinking about how to um, get more creative shots and better shots. So uh, one, uh, this last year, I, I suddenly re realized an idea. I said, John, I have been getting a lot of photos uh, in different scenarios over the years, but I have never gotten like a backlit bear pouncing for fish with the background of four colors, right? I said, wouldn't it be awesome if we can find that? And what, right, like you guys agree, <laughs> like this would be yeah. awesome with the, 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 the golden color in the background. So I talked to John and what jo John's answer to me was very shocking. And I've never uh, thought about, you, you mentioned, right, John, there's a, there's a phrase uh, describing that, be, that people usually don't go in after maybe September. 
Well, usually as the salmon run starts to run down, it's uh, I think they return, refer to the term as like a hyperphagia or something. It's like in people, um, when the food source isn't good, uh, bears turn their attention elsewhere and they're in a transition. So there's different stages of transition and I see Drew's on there as well. So uh, he knows this very well. Uh -huh. um, so bears go through different stages as they wake up. Um, I've seen in Kodiak where people want to see the spring bears and I said, well, they're, they're a little bit cranky. If they've been sleeping, they're, they wake up and then somebody's got a big camera lens in their face. That's probably not a good introduction to, to spring for them because they're, they're still a little bit groggy, constipated and haven't had any food. So they're, they're not in the best of moods. So that's, and then they start eating on the sedges, which is a type of grass that provides them protein and they can pack on weight until the fish start to run. Mm -hmm. And so each stage is a different transition for them in food source and supply. Mm -hmm. And then as they get late in the summer towards fall, they switch into another mode where they want to really pack up. They, they know they, they got to pack on the pounds to make it through winter. Uh -huh. Yes. And, and so when they, when the fish start to run out, you don't want to be the object of their attention. Mm -hmm. I see. So I think uh, well, one of my friends, uh, Adriana, was asking me about uh, Camaya bears and those, and uh, like, are they all, all safe, right? We have that feeling that, oh, like these bears are yeah. in coastal area, they are safe. But I said mostly, but it's, it's almost like what you just mentioned, right? When when we, like, when, like, like Tin Man is a nice guy, right? But when Tin Man is hungry, then we become hangry Tin Man. <laughs> and then you don't want to mess with, uh, well, I'm okay. But, but you understand the, the thing is that, Bears are, are very much like uh, humans, and they they have bad days and they have good days. Maybe they just like lose a fight, right, with uh, like, or, or whatever. And and that's when um, maybe you can touch upon the the experience. Is there, anybody watched the the the, uh, the Netflix the the movie uh, Grizzly Man? Uh, type in the chat if you have watched that. Um, you, you know uh, Timothy Timothy Treadwell is the the guy in the in the in the show, and I would re highly recommend you guys to watch that. To really, uh, I don't know if it's actually a good uh, education piece on on that, but but John actually had some connection with uh, with uh, with this this story because he his pilot is actually the one who picked up the remains of uh, uh, that uh, that guy. But but can you tell us more about what really happened? Like what what do you think caused? Well. This I don't know the full story because I was living abroad at the time it happened and, but uh, I heard about it and I've asked the pilot about it and he's told me a few details, but not everything. And understandably because he considered him a friend as well. But um, uh, Timothy Treadwell would fly in and out of Kodiak to Katmai and, and uh, do the things that he thought he was doing. I'll just say it nicely. I, I, I didn't know the guy. Um, I think when he first started out, he had the right ideas and good intentions, but uh, going out, the biggest mistake I think he made was going out two weeks after the fish run had stopped. Mm -hmm. And probably the second big mistake he made was putting his campsite right at the intersection of a century trail, which, which is named a century trail because for centuries, bears have walked in the same paths as other bears. And, you know, things that I wouldn't recommend doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and with the outcome being what we all know now is it wasn't a wise decision. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I heard that the, the attack was due to uh, some older bears. So is it because when the bears get old, they are not very good at catching salmon, so they would be more of, become more like opportunist and... I think it was a number of things, yes. Uh, it could be partially that, but I think it was more... Um, I've heard stories that he had a, a, an abscess as well, which would make him un, un easy if he had an abscess tooth. and. And we'll talk more about uh, transference and things that happen with bears before you get there that can affect your uh, experience with a bear. Mm -hmm. But um, the bear was older and food had run out, but there was a sow there that mm -hmm. he apparently was interested in is what the story was, but I don't know, like I said, I don't know all the details, mm -hmm. but Timothy was bathing with that bear next to the bear the day before he was killed. And that was in, I think that was one of the last clips he had in that film. Um, the bear didn't like it. And I don't know what led up to the events on that day, but the bear came up in, into the, uh, the campsite mm -hmm. and attacked him and his uh, girlfriend is all I, uh, that's only the details I, that, that I, I know. 
I see. So, um, and so some of the reasons that you think it might be, right, because we don't really have all the reason is because it's also late in the season, right? That's what you yes. just mentioned, the salmon sauce is running out. So, so, you know, for photography as well, I think everybody should bear this in mind is you just have to put in, in the shoes of the animals, right? If they don't have food sauce, you don't want to mess with them and they need all the calories they, they, they need during that time. And if you just get so close and get to them, this is bound to they <clears throat> have stuff that, that happens, right? So what yeah. about, um, the um the attack uh, last year in in uh in uh, is it near west yellowstone you you said that you 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 do you know that the guy oh carl mock yeah yeah I, I i've met him yeah i know him i see and, well he he i the story that i heard from the the rangers that were there is that he walked inadvertently into a, a interior grizz if you mm -hmm. will like we have in alaska a grizzly protecting its uh a moose carcass uh -huh. and they will defend it uh they will come after you and that's what happened he was attacked without warning uh -huh. um, he really didn't have a, a chance uh -huh. and uh even in it, it could happen to a very experienced guy such as himself uh -huh. and uh, the phrase i like to use all the time is keep your head on a on a swivel you know uh -huh. 360 always pay attention if you've been out with a bear a hundred times and you've had a good experience do not let down your guard. Always, uh -huh. always pay attention to the bear. The bear will give you signs of what's going to happen. I see. And, and then there's some bears that won't give you a sign. They, maybe uh -huh. they had like a, a, the bear had an abscess or maybe a, a group came through and pushed the bear and then the bear is upset. The next thing that comes along, it goes after that person. You just don't know. I see. And and you mentioned that the guy is very experienced, right? So sometimes um, it's yes. just uh, un unfortunate. And and for some of you who don't know what uh, John mentioned about the cash is, um, so imagine you haven't eaten for a whole winter or you haven't eaten for a few days and then you get a meal that is going to, basically, if you lose the meal, you're going to starve to death. So same as the bear, they, they, they found uh, maybe a carcass that like maybe an, an elk or whatever that died over the winter and they got the food. It. And after they eat a part of it, they want they don't have fridge, right? So what they do is, and if they show the the carcass outside, then um, some coyotes or some foxes and those may steal the food, right? So what they do is, uh, I don't know if it's the same as in Africa, is um, the lions will just kind of uh, use the, the the sand and mud to cover the intestine so that the smell doesn't go further. Uh, but but anyway, so so the idea is like that. So they cover um, the the carcass with uh, tree branches and all these thing so you can't even see them so if you're walking and if you step on somebody else's food then they whisk their life they, because they didn't know the bears didn't know they thought you was gonna steal their food so they're gonna just and what they do is in the fear oh, how come I'm, I'm saying <laughs> usually so i i'm just putting my shoes like if you are gonna steal my only food for like a few months i'm gonna kill you first before i do anything that's a, right? that's a very good analogy because that's basically what they're doing is they're protecting their food source uh for instance a coastal brown or a Kodiak bear is going to have, oh, I lost a salmon, right? You'll see them just take a bite out, throw the rest away. Uh -huh. And some other a bird or something else will pick up the remains because uh -huh. they know there's more salmon there. An interior grizz or a grizz in Montana or Yellowstone is going to be super protective because they don't have that plentiful food supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that came to the encounter I had with you and Lydia, and I still remember, <laughs> like, um, so you, you, so Lydia and you were talk like we were walking on the trail, and you were paying so much attention, like all your senses were like, hundred percent, like, like, like 10 X, the, the thing, like, oh, you, like, there's a bear, like, probably a few minutes early i can smell it and then you can see the hair on some of the trees branches and stuff yep. so you and then you you back up it, it so really like um uh like and then if you connect with uh cows and counter i mean cow is must have been paying a lot of attention to i don't know but if uh, somebody who are new, you just have to be super careful in checking on, like try to smell, like if, what, what kind of smell are they gonna detect? <laughs> uh, it's hard to describe the scent, but once you've smelled it, you'll never forget it. It's yeah. um, It's got a slight ammonia smell. I always call it like a ammonia, and for lack of a better word, crap. I mean, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's it stinks, it, it, it's, it's a pungent smell. Uh -huh. Maybe closer to a, 
a really strong feral cat or something like that, but it's really pungent. Okay. And you'll never forget it once you smell it. Okay. And then you, you seem to be paying even more attention to black bears than, than brown bears. Is, is there, why, why is that? Because, well, for instance, in Alaska, most of the deaths caused by bears um, and most wildlife encounters are not and where it results in death uh, in Alaska are, are actually caused by moose. But uh, in Alaska, for bears, black bears kill far more people than a brown bear does. I see. Um, the difference is a brown bear, being that they're so predatory, they will um, knock you down and basically push away the threat. Where a black bear, when they're attacking you, are trying to kill you. That's the oh, yeah. difference. Mm -hmm. That's their intent. They're not. They're not trying to push you away, so to speak. They go after you with with an intent to kill. That's why um, when you're talking about what to do if you're knocked down by a bear, with a brown bear, you get knocked down, you're gonna stomach on the ground, face down, cover your neck. Hopefully you have a backpack on that'll protect you. You don't and kind of play dead. And even if they bite on you, you're not gonna move if at all possible. With a black bear, you don't wanna do that. You wanna fight them back. And hopefully you have your spray with you. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so, and then I heard that um, yearlings may be more aggressive than like. Is there any correlate like, like relation about those? Yearlings. Uh, so you're talking about the the young cubs, but typically it's a, the sub adults that are sub adults. Okay, I see. I see. So like, um, so that's why, because I saw that you had your monopod extended and then the bear spray right on your hand, which was the first time I saw that because, um, oh, I just noticed that, uh, uh, something here with, uh, John, somebody said not true. Um, black bears do not attack more people than brown bears. I didn't say they attack more people than brown bears. I said most of the deaths in Alaska by bears have been black bears. So, uh, let's be clear about that. Uh -huh. Yeah, and attacks are, are not common, right? But it's just it's just like when there is attacks are rare, and you know, people by their behavior can can uh, mitigate or avoid it if possible. And uh -huh. by just being patient and calm, you can usually diffuse most most encounters with bears. Um, we a lot of what we do affects what the bear is going to do next, and that's why it's important uh, uh -huh. how we react. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Thanks, John. I mean, uh, for for letting us clarify that that info. Yeah, because sometimes, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm just I'm reading his second thesis. Um, he just said uh, I don't know who who this is. It's saying it. I'm just reading the comments off the side. It says I'm just sorry to stop it, but oh yeah, yeah good, good. That's not true either. Brown bears kill more people than black bears. Uh, I'm not saying they don't. I'm saying in Alaska, the deaths recorded by bears, even though they're rare. Have been more black bear attacks than brown bears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the attacks that were resulted in death were black bears more than the brown bears. I see. I see. So, um, so you would advise um, people to um, uh, bring the bear spray, right, all the time. Well, unless they're really proficient with a firearm, and I don't recommend carrying a firearm if you're not proficient with it. Uh, an experienced hunter would probably do well, um, but. Uh, as far as with bear spray, it's easier to use and it has a, uh, I think the published results are uh, about a 90% efficacy. So if you know how to use it and disperse it, mm -hmm. usually the bears will, 90% is what they say. Um, I can't verify that because that's just what's published. Um, mm -hmm. I see, I see. And then, um, so um, some of the people may ask, like, when is the time to end, like, use the, the, the spray? When do, you, when do you know, really? When, when to use it? Well, um, if you have those two pictures I sent you, the one where the bear is yes. eating mm -hmm. on the well. Mm -hmm. so yes, cool. yes. Okay. We could share that one. Uh, yes, hold on one second. I'm just going to... Yeah, and again, uh, if you have any questions, please type in the Q and A, and then we will get back to you at the end. Okay, you can see that, right? So, what is what? What yeah. are we looking at? <laughs> so, let, usually at the beginning of the season, we go out and we we uh, 
explore and see what's out there. And we found this, this was last year, we found on a remote beach, a sperm well that had uh, washed up on the beachhead. And this large boar came in. And when he arrived, everybody cleared out. He was quite huge and I apparently had a good reputation because everybody, there were several bears there. There was nine bears total, they all backed off. Most didn't seem too happy. They just reluctantly went over and sat down and waited their turn. So here he is at the, at the, at the table. And then, uh, so one of the bears he, he uh, moved away was a young uh, sub-adult female. And if you pull up that one, I, that next photo where, where, uh, so if you notice in this one, her ears are back. She's not happy. She got pushed off the, the whale. So she walked over to our group uh, looking just like this. Uh, and uh, we call it transference because she had been pushed off her food source. And so we had to just take some steps forward and she backed off. It took two or three tries before she finally backed off. But this is a bear you would have possibly sprayed or, or um, use a deterrent, but um, Oh, wow. It's just a it's just a case of where we don't know what kind of encounter the bear had before we were there, but in this case we watched it play out. Mm -hmm. I see, and uh, and then you have no, no, yeah. thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so what I learned from John is um, just don't get comfortable uh, when you think that, okay, uh, I'm already taking photos of the bears and uh, and the bear seems to be accepting my presence, but you just have to look at this, um, is it called the micro move body movement? Like, like, like for, for example, when I look at a, a bear as a photographer, I would just look at, oh, eye contact, yes, I'm gonna snap the shot. But what you see is um, the whole context of the story, right? Oh, this bear got pushed away, and so they, she didn't couldn't eat. And now also the years, I didn't even realize it until you mentioned about it. So the years back, like, is there a reason why they, they, they put down like the, the, the years down? Well, it's to show that they're, they're um, it's not so much because they can do them down or forward, but in this case, she was coming because she was uh, clearly agitated or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. So, um, so for for a bear guy, then you probably will just uh, like like kind of show like some that you are aware of her coming and then get her yes. to back, back up, right? Sometimes just talking to them, uh, you don't have to yell and scream, just, just talking to them and standing up. If you're kneeling down, taking photos and just standing, just the act of standing up often backs them away. I see, I see. Okay, so just um, kind of show that you are not super small right, in, in, in their eyes. Yeah. Right, and there you can make yourself bigger by various means, but the main thing is to, you know, keep control of the situation, including yourself. I mean, don't, don't get frantic. Don't get, uh, I know it's hard to say that when a bear's walking towards you, but mm -hmm. you, you read the bear and what you try and uh, avoid any further encounter by just talking and maybe take a couple steps forward. Each encounter is going to be handled a little differently based on what the bear is showing you. Mm -hmm. And so you can take this out of context, you know, where you see just her head in here because she was walking towards the group. Mm -hmm. But um, other bears might come in a trot. They might be coming full on. You know, it's, uh -huh. it just depends. Like we've seen in Lake Clark where the, yeah. the bear just from about 200 yards out was casually walking. And then suddenly the last 100 yards, he picked up his pace and cruised right up to the, the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're super fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you blink your eyes and then they are right in front of you. So just you have to pay super attention to them. And um, I remember you you mentioned a, a story that you had uh, last winter, uh, like when you were photographing and uh, a lady was um, also photographing near you. And then, uh, like, can, do you remember what what which one? Can you tell the story and see the? Yes, yes, we had. And uh, Kodiak, we had a late silver run this year in which uh, kept a few bears entertained and packing on the extra pounds. One, There was one young sow in particular that hung out for uh, about six extra weeks. And then there was a, a mom bear with their uh, two spring cubs mm -hmm. that also was there. But towards the end of the season, uh, I think it was near Christmas, she was... Uh, getting a little more protective because the fish run had dwindled down the, the lower river had frozen. And so the fish weren't getting up to where she was. And she had been visibly showing frustration that day. 
Mm -hmm. And a woman had pulled up in her car and got out. And I just, because I was standing there and I said, um, ma'am, just so you're aware, this bear is a little bit agitated right now. So you should be on your guard. And she said, understood. And I said, okay. So I stood back by my car and Lydia was sitting inside and I just watched what happened next. And that was after a few minutes, the bear had missed a couple salmon. And, and so she was stomping on the ice on the edge of the bank and breaking it off. And I said, ma'am, you should be aware. She's, she's more agitated now. So just maybe step back a little bit. And she said, okay. And then she proceeded to take a step forward, <laughs> took a step forward. And, and when she did that, Almost instantly, the, the sow stood up at full attention, gave a little uh, growl, took two steps across the water, came down and broke off the ice below her on the bank and growled again. She quickly got into her car and she goes, I'm getting in my car now. Um, Lydia was laughing, but I was, I was saying, you, this is what I try to avoid because in that case, had she just backed up a little bit, the bear probably would have been fine. And, and she was getting to that stage where the, the mom bear was protecting her last of her food source and she, the, the salmon were frustrating her. So she was a little bit irritated. And so that one foot step forward identified that woman as a possible threat for her food, food source. So she, she was not having any part of it. Mm -hmm. But just that little couple steps, break the ice and growl, um, she wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So, so basically, um, that should, pe people just need to learn from observing their behavior. Like if they, they just changes their behavior, you should. If a bear is actively fishing uh, any time of the year, it doesn't matter if it's winter, but especially at that time when it's clearly past the prime time, um, they're going to be pr more protective and you never want to interfere with their behavior. So you, you want to keep them fishing no matter what time of year is, if they're fishing, let them fish. Mm -hmm. Don't stop their behavior and don't become the center of their attention. And mm -hmm. that's what it does in this case. She took the focus off the fish over to her. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, so I, I haven't been checking on the message, but I just remember one thing that, um, uh, that, that John was telling me some time ago, but I want to share with you. So, um, you know, sometimes, um, uh, in Alaska, for example, in Katmai, um, there is this thing called the game trail. If you guys don't know, so it's the, 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 the where the bear has been walking for hundreds of years. So the tall grass has been like, like the kind of like, it becomes like a path, like a path to roll for the bears. So when you go and photograph bears, sometimes you would walk on those trails to look for the bears. But when the bear is coming towards you, so you're basically sharing this role with you. And what you do is uh, you just stay calm and just give space for the bears to walk by, right? And as you remember, I had this encounter too, and uh, it was not with John, but many years ago. And the guy would say, oh, everybody, um, stay calm, don't move, uh, don't make any sound. So you, you're not supposed to even unzip your, your thing and, 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 and change the lens and stuff, change to the wide angle lens. No, no, you just don't do anything, right? So we are all staying on, our, like staying, like keep like frozen and then just not say a word. And I remember the bear was like walking closer and closer by and walking uh, past us. And you know, there are some moments that the bear can be pretty close to you and everything was calm, like walking by and all. The crazy thing was, um, so the, the guy told us to stay calm and stuff. So we didn't say anything, like just like breathing and stuff. But then for like this split second, that inside my mind, I was like, crap, like, I'm actually really scared. <laughs> I didn't say anything. My my face didn't change. You see that the bear's ears are up, like like looking at you, like like that, like. And I never understand. Like I said, I didn't even change my, anything. Like how did they do it? And one of the uh, the the reason is bears. Right, John was telling me that they have like they, they smelling was what hundred times better than human or something. Uh, than a bloodhound. It's seven 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 eight times I think better than a bloodhound. Yeah, there's, so there's the, several different specs on it, but it's very, very sensitive and they can smell blood from quite a long way, range away. Uh huh. So you almost have like they can basically, <laughs> I don't know how to uh, describe it, but almost like they can smell your fear. Is that <laughs> oh. well, that, that's true with, with probably most wildlife, they can they can smell the uh, the uh, what is it, the 
pheromones or whatever they call it. The, uh -huh. And they could smell the elevated, you know, uh, odor uh -huh. being given off. But um, that leads me to another thing. And when it comes to going outdoors with any wildlife, but especially bears, a lot of people will wear uh, really pungent uh, skin creams and lotions and stuff. Uh, when you're out with bears, you don't want to be wearing any of that. You try and find something, if you're using sunscreen or bug repellent, something that's a little more natural smelling and it doesn't draw the bear's attention because that can bring them your way when you don't really want them coming up and saying hi to you or maybe licking your face or something like that. But mm -hmm. I'm, joking, I'm joking on the licking your face, but you know, it's, it's an attractant that you don't want to have out there with you. I see. I see. Yeah. So also, I think it goes to the theme of understanding um, the behavior and the special cap special capability of bears. That they, they just uh, the smelling is so good that so you don't want to create. And that's that's why also that pepper spray, that bear spray is working, right? Because of the the strong uh, yeah pepper that that would irritate them and have hope, hopefully they will they will they will get get better. So how do you really? I, I think there is a lot of YouTube. Videos Video showing the uh, how do you engage the the bear spray, but um, I, I, what I heard is that wind makes a <laughs> big factor. Uh, the wind direction makes a. With what I what I do is if I'm going to deploy it, the first thing I do is I kind of put my hand behind my back and feel for the wind. It's not always possible, but I always try to pay attention. Always oh. when I'm outside is where where I'm upwind or downwind of the of the wildlife. Mm -hmm. So you generally know which direction the wind is. If it's a very windy day, don't even think about it. It's probably not good. You're probably going to get hurt more than the bear is. Uh -huh. um, and I saw some people ask a lot of questions. And a uh, few people I've seen have, it's the bear spray is effective probably up to about 30 feet. I've seen some can say up to 60 feet. I wouldn't do that. I mean, um, and then you also want to spray it down. You don't want to spray it up. I've seen people deploy it in the, the rivers around uh, Kodiak near the airport where the guy just randomly sprayed it in the air. And I, I asked him, what, what are you doing? And he said, I'm spraying my bear spray so the bear doesn't come around. I said, well, that's not going to work. Because it's just dissipating above him. The bear's down low. And so when they're coming in, they're usually their heads down. And you want to spray it down downward and, you know, eight, eight to about 30 feet. Mm hmm any so, closer than that, you're probably gonna have contact anyways. But yeah. uh, somebody, I think I read, I watched some of the YouTube video. They said like you don't spray at the bear. You kind of spray and create a cloud in front of you, let's say 10, 15 feet away, and let them run into that cloud, and then they back up. Is that real or like? There's, it's there's if you look at each uh, bear spray manufacturer, like I have these here because I happen to have them here at the hotel where I'm at, and. So each one will tell you what the efficacy is and how they want you to do it. There's, like you said, there's several YouTube videos. Um, I think uh, a few people have posted something on there, but there's some great videos out there. Um, you can buy a, a null can, which doesn't have the actual uh, pepper in it, so you can get used to spraying it. You can see how it comes out and how the stream and the cloud is formed, but it doesn't have the actual uh, what, what is it irritant. called? It's kind of, uh, I think they call it like a null or a training Oh, training. Training. oh, they're training ones. Okay. Yeah, so you can learn how to do it. And I think uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife does it in Kodiak, and then there's a couple other places that, that do it. So you can go out and train it. Or I, I think there's a few people in Kodiak that tried it with a husband and wife team, and and uh, probably not the best thing because I think if the wind carries it into them as it did in their video, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, it makes makes for a fun video, but uh, probably a lot of crying there in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember one of my good friends, he said one time he was also testing the, the bear spray, the, the real one, and he just said kind of like this uh, from, from far distance, but one of the water, like those bear spray droplet, like tiny spot, kind of flows in the air and then drop on, on, onto his glasses. And he said that for three hours, he couldn't even speak because of yeah. the, how strong it is. Right? So you got to be super careful how to use it. Yeah, even when it's in the air, we we were around where it was sprayed, and it gives you a little a little tingle even with the wind behind you. It's still it's still lingering in there. Uh huh. I see. Ah, okay. So um, so that that is that is very good. So are there any? Uh, let me let me see. Let me. So everything everybody um, still good with with this.
So let me let me see. Um, so we talk about um, some of the the bear attack. So in the springtime and in like basically when they come out from the hibernation, and maybe at the end of the season, um, usually they they don't have a lot of food, right? So you know that is the time um, that um, things can happen in a more yeah yeah. Don't don't go out camping and cooking bacon and. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll bring them in too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, da, 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 okay, um, can you tell us? A, so um, okay, um, so what what can people do uh, when they go out? So definitely, um, so in Yellowstone they can hire. They they usually don't hire a bear guide, right? So usually it's in Alaska when they hire a bear guide. So uh, what kind of uh, things, like if you are to go out, okay, so for example, now you're going to hike, uh, like for, for today, this morning, for example, um, you kind of, can you kind of go through what, what is in your mindset, like if you're going to hiking and you're going to look for bears to take photos? Um, like this morning when we were out, uh, you always kind of want to plan where you're going in advance so that you, if you're not familiar with the area, kind of get familiar with it. Um, you don't want to come around a corner and walk right into a bear uh, if you're not familiar with the area and there's a lot of brush right now is we're coming out of winter so not a lot of brush out there but there's still a lot of snow and the bear could be right around the corner when you're walking through uh, thick trees so you you want to make sure you make a lot of noise mm -hmm. um, conversation works fine uh, others use music that's fine as well but you want to make sure you can still hear if there's something moving in the trees or in the background uh -huh. uh, carry uh always carrying the, the spray or or some form of bear spray with me mm -hmm. um uh, the noise factor i saw somebody had mentioned bells bells work i but uh I, I don't have any real experience with them otherwise just keeping your conversation going and music seems to work really well um, sometimes you have bears that are just curious and they're going to walk out just to see what you're doing mm -hmm. and just like you said with with people there's a uh, there's good and bad. And sometimes there's just bad bears and we've had them in Kodiak over the years and um, they're just going to mess with people and, and do what they want to do. And we had a few, a couple of sibling sub adults a few years ago, and there was one that the locals called yellow face. And I know that once the people on here from Kodiak will remember her, uh, she, uh, she actively would walk up on people. She didn't care. She had no fear mm -hmm. and, and she was more of an alpha female. So, um, I think eventually, I can't remember if she got hunted or uh, as, as uh, most people know who are from Alaska, we have an annual hunt right now. There's an active uh, spring bear hunt going on in Kodiak where there's a limited uh, tags uh, issued for bear hunting. And it's a way of game management for the, the bears. And, and so that ends in, I think in about two and a half weeks or so, maybe three weeks from now. And, uh, so bears might be a little bit harder to find. Sometimes we have them in town getting into people's trash. But uh, so bears in Kodiak are typically, we say shy or a little bit skittish because they know they're hunted. But we do get this like this female bear that was an alpha and she had a sibling that they traveled together and they were uh, like the Bash brothers. They came through and just wreaked havoc wherever they were. They got into one of the hotels and a uh, little bit of a nuisance, but they finally, I think uh, one of the troopers told me it was hunted. So um, the other thing to remember is if you walk up on a bear in the open, it has a chance to get away. It has an exit route. Uh, we always say give a bear at least two ways out. Um, if you run into him on the trail, uh, sometimes you can give him the trail. Sometimes the bear just wants to walk up and uh, walk by you, but just keep talking and let them know you're human. Mm -hmm. You don't want to run. You don't want to go climb in a tree. Um, but if they do keep pursuing you as you back away, uh, for instance, you see them and you start backing away and they keep countering you. And if you have bear spray, you might want to get that ready just in case. Uh -huh. um, I wouldn't want to just leave it in my pocket. I'd want to have it out, maybe have the safety ready to clip off. Or if you're familiar with it, just pop the safety off so that you're ready to use it if they get within 60 feet of you. Uh, uh -huh. If they start, and once they close that, 60 feet and they start they keep coming yeah yeah you don't know and you better be ready in that case just to use the bear spray just in case 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also almost seems to me that um, a lot of the uh, bear attack in the news is uh, usually like when you walk around a corner or the the, peop the, the person got being yeah. attacked, didn't even see the bear coming. Right. And, like, so is that... That's why you want to make noise so that uh, the bears will move away because most, most bears are going to avoid you. And a lot of people I've talked to have never seen a bear, but yet... They've been probably within 10 yards of one when they've been out hiking because they, they, they don't want to mess with you and they, they don't want to um, engage you. They typically are moving away from you. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've run into uh, bears on the trail and just by talking, they, they look and then they keep on walking. And, and again, that was during summer when they have a plentiful food source and that's in Kodiak. Mm -hmm. uh, had I been in Montana on a hike, that would have been a different experience. I see, I see. So okay, so just so got to be and like and so what? What about uh, the difference between Kodiak bear and Katmai and Lake Clark? Are they much bigger? Are they? Uh... Well, it's it's basically they're very similar and they're they're just a different subspecies of the same same bear. So you have the uh, I'll, I'll pull up my my document on that here for you because I think I sent it to you, but I'll. I'll talk a bit, a little bit about. Oh it. yeah, yeah. I, I have the the, the link. Uh, so so uh, John uh, sent me two PDFs, and I will share with you guys uh, with the link. Most of it's from uh, Alaska Department of Fishing Game, and then there's another uh, couple of uh, documents about from other uh, sites that have put together really nice bits of information that they collected from national parks, fishing game, and. Uh, uh, I think some sources are in there from Yellowstone as well, because mm -hmm. different different regions, different bears, uh, different experiences, and um, yeah, the Kodiak is still the same. Um, it's a subspecies of the Urs Ursus arcus, mm -hmm. and they're the, they're the Ursus arcus middendorfi. But it's uh, uh, Kodiak bears have been isolated. Um, I think it's approximately twelve thousand years on the island since the last uh, ice age. Mm -hmm. so they've had their own unique food source, and that's why they're considered the largest land predator. The polar bear is mm -hmm. similar in size and weight, mm -hmm. but the polar bear is classified, I believe, as a sea mammal because they live most of their time at sea. And probably Drew can answer that one better because he has a lot more experience with polar bears than I do. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but Kodiak is considered the largest brown bear. I see. I see. So, um, so am I correct to say that? So most of the time, um, bears, you know, everything should be okay. But then you just want to avoid the unexpected. So that's why we just be hundred percent prepared every time we go out, right? Well, I've I've had this question actually by a photographer in, in Kodiak, and he asked me. He goes, "Well, I want to go down some of these trails, but..." I'm afraid to run into a bear. And I said, how about going at it from a different angle? I said, how about you say, um, I'm going out expecting to run into a bear. So that way, if you do run into one, you don't panic and you think things through. If you go out with the feeling that, oh God, I better not run into a bear. Uh -huh. And then you do have one, you might do something like turn around too quickly or run or, you know, uh, it's just, there's a lot of different things that go in there. If you, if you tell yourself, I'm probably going to run into a bear going out there and you know, it's bear time, it's mm -hmm. your bear country. Yeah. I think it, I think it kind of takes a little bit of the, the stress level down a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, and I, I mean, I myself um, had uh, done, done it like once or twice. It's say like you, you know, something like the scenario was that you're going with a bunch of friends to hike and there's one of them have a bear spray and you are okay. But due to some, something that happens, maybe you have to leave early to your vehicle or something. And then you say, Oh, but, but they don't only have one bear spray. And this one time in Yellowstone, that was what happened to me. And I said, ah, okay, I really have to, to rush back to the hotel. So I, I walk like there was like a mile uh, that I walk in and the grass was so tall and you just can't see anything. And that fear in myself, we say, and any sound that happens in the grass, it just like scares you so much. And then you were basically helpless. If you only have like this big lens <laughs> that, 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 
I don't think it can protect you. And that is totally not worth it because when there is an attack and you don't have anything to protect yourself and if um, if the bear hurts you and they, they may euthanize the bear and that, that is not something that you also want to cause, right? So it's just very critical that we have everything to make sure that there is not an like not a un, like unhappy encounter there. Just try to avoid that conflict. And that's that's a that's another good point you brought up. So when when you're traveling in bear country, if you can, uh, we always recommend no less than three people in a group. Um, and I know this for a fact because we were out two years ago when it was just three of us, and it was mating season, and we had the like the perfect storm of events. We were in Hallow Bay. There's a, a humpback whale carcass. So I'll, I'll sidebar here and go off on a little story. But wow. um, so Lydia and I and another photographer from Kodiak were there. And uh, so we had another group that were leaving and the pilot's wife walked them back. So it's a couple miles across Hallow Bay. You've been there, you know how big it is. And, mm -hmm. and so we were alone uh, observing in the meadow, the bears. And then the tide came in with a, uh, a near record tide. So it was a full moon, uh, the tide, literally we watched it rush across the, the meadow and so we had to move back so we decided to back up and then the young sub adults had at that very same time two big boars came up and were circling each other and and uh establishing a hierarchy right there so all of those there was a dozen bears on there most of the sub adults were dispersed and they came right towards us <laughs> So I started pushing back bears. We, we um, made some noise and pushed off. There was one five-year-old female that was particularly more aggressive than the others, but she pushed away relatively quickly and went about her business. She was too busy playing with the boars and, and like I said, the mating time. So she was having fun with the boars, the bigger boars. Mm -hmm. But the sub-adults, the young ones, they decided they were going to come up with us. And the only place that was high enough was where their old bear beds were. And so we were, we were standing up there and there was one little female that was, we called her sassy because she was, she was something else. And she came up to Lydia, I think it was what the third time, I think it was on the third time and I was measuring the breeze and I was reaching to pull out my spray. And I heard, I heard the, the sound of the spray being dispersed. And I thought it was the other photographer just on the, on the right of Lydia, but it was Lydia had said, okay, she had closed up the gap and she goes, you got to in it. And I was, I was impressed because I had only told her how to do the spray, but she did it textbook. Perfect. She fired down, hit that bear. And it was like one of those movies, like a John wick where she got the bear in front and then the two males behind her. Wow. <laughs> and so it was like the, the, you know, when you see those movies, when they do like the assassin kill where he gets uh -huh. all three of them with one bullet. Well, that's what she did. She did one, one little burst. Uh -huh. got the female and got the two males behind her they went away uh -huh. problem solved i see <laughs> and i was impressed with how quickly and that's that's exactly the time that you want to do that uh -huh. you want to be um paying attention to the bear because if the bear's just being a bear and is curious that's fine um let them be curious but don't let them get too close because once they get too close even if they sit down and they look like they're minding their own business you don't know what they're going to do. And if, a, if somebody makes a sound or a cough or sneezes, maybe mm -hmm. they jump and they react and another bear reacts. You just don't want to do that if mm -hmm. at all possible. I see. Yeah. Um, I, th I, I remember when I was um, um, like uh, some years back in Alaska and um, you know, uh, sometimes when you are photographing a mom with the cubs, the cubs are just like any babies. They got curious and they see humans and sometimes they will come close. But the, the moment when they come close, you can feel the tense because these babies were like, they are, they are very curious, they are very playful, but they are also very scared. So they will be like, like, like you, you know, the, the moment, like they may get scared and then they are standing up and, um, and so those are actually not good because you, you mentioned, right? If the, the, the mom sees that the babies are, oh, you, you'll continue. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you have that picture of the young cub walking through the grass, well, I'll tell that story about what, what happened with a young cub and uh, mom with spring cubs. Okay. So, uh, uh, so not this one. But... Not that one. Not that one. <clears throat> not that one. This one. 
Okay. So mom's in the background. She was, we had a group and we were, we were sitting along a, uh, some driftwood and just watching the bears from about 200 yards out. They were gradually grazing towards us. Mm -hmm. And he was just, he was a real curious little male. And the mom came first and she walked behind us, uh, not right next to us, but behind and, and then the meadow behind us was grazing. And then the cubs started walking through. So we all had big lines and we were shooting. And then the two walked in between people. And of course we can't move at that point because they're, they're so, they had gotten to the point. You don't want to move and disrupt their behavior. So we just stayed to where, which is the people who have been in cat mind know this is what you're supposed to do. And they walked right past us. And then this little guy walked right up, stopped at the pilot's wife who was there with us sniffed her boot and continued walking and i had my guide shirt on but i had my big lens and i wanted to pull out my camera but just the sound of the zipper might have caused the bear to jump so we didn't dare make any noise because if that little cub jumps guess what happens with mom you know and so we just had a great memory of it and a great story to tell but by just maintaining our cool and just staying where we were and not standing up or if we would have stood up who knows what would have happened Mm -hmm. But the right call was to just don't move, let them continue doing what they're doing, and they went about their business. Yeah, and so even even if you have your camera in hand with the shutter, uh, agitate them when they're so close, it, it might? Um, it might, but generally we've had bears, and and, uh, and those those people who have been in Geographic Harbor know that the bears will fish right past you. And, and It might if you're using a DA-50. <laughs> oh well, yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> oh, one DX Mark II, but this is the mirrorless. Actually, actually, mirrorless is, is helping. I, I think uh, in one of our tours, um, we were uh, they, the whole group was using were using mirrorless, and then I think one of the participant was uh, uh, was it you? <laughs> well, no, you yeah. had the Z7 at the time, but like one of them have a di digital SLR and. The, the, and then, then you realize how much louder the, the sound yeah, is. The, no, the noise. Yeah, yeah. Noise. yeah, yeah. But anyway, so so okay. So that is uh, that is a good point. Is there any other pictures you want to describe? Like uh, you sent me these two. Right? Is that? Oh, a, this was question? yeah. This was last year in in July and uh, particularly wet day in in uh, Hallow Bay, mm -hmm. and it was the end of mating season. And this this big guy was interested in the the sow that was working her way past us and then mm -hmm. around, she was doing a big arc around us mm -hmm. and because we were off to the side and then, you know, they're, gra they're grazing and he's following to like the boars do. And so I snapped this picture when he looked up to, cause she was moving. Mm -hmm. And so he went in a big arc around. Yeah. And then because apparently she had been over where we were at at some point, he made a, a big swing. And usually the big bears don't do that. They'll just keep on walking by, but something in her scent there was something he was interested in. So he did a big circle. And then if you pull up that next picture of him, that's when he stopped and he he just looked at us. He was perfectly calm. And so we backed up, gave him a space. And all he wanted to do was he knelt, he put his head down, sniffed the grass, and then he licked the grass and then con continued on after her. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, if you, were to look at this, you would think, oh, he's he's a ferocious bear, but he actually was just coming over. He's chewing at that point. You can see the grass hanging off the side of his mouth. Uh -huh. And he was just interested in her and what he was doing. And because we backed up and gave him the area, he was perfectly okay. He just continued on pursuing her. Mm -hmm. I see. Wow. Well, so one thing I learned, um, which I like animals more than, than humans, is uh, you know, um, like for for bears. Uh, and what what I learned a lot from John too is uh, their facial expression, their their, their 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 body movement, and every body language tells you what they are thinking. Like they're not like human, where where we hide our emotion, and then when you are not happy, you hide it. For them, like you can always see them the the problem is do you know how to what to look at and and what that means and once you pay more attention to it right like i was you remember in the lot in lake cloud you were telling me okay like like, like this bear is not happy now oh this is happy I said, how do you know but um but yeah well, and then and, and on that note when we were when we had the big boar the, the cub killing boar that came through 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, he was walking by and we gave him the path and he, he paid no attention to us. He just looked and continued on, went down into the river and was fishing and then stood up on the bank. Mm -hmm. When he stood up on the bank, he was perfectly calm and we were waiting for him to jump in again on some fish. Yeah. Well, another group came up, mm -hmm. a group, mm -hmm. and instead of, fast, right? yeah. instead of going around and working their way towards him, they made a straight line towards him. And I, I turned to you and you said, oh, you're not happy. And I said, no, it's what they're doing is what you don't want to do. They're making a beeline straight for him. And being sees a, you know, big, comfortable bore. He just said, I'm out of here. And instead of fishing, he quit fishing uh, and was gone. And that was a case where they disrupted his, uh, mm -hmm. his series. And so we, we got to watch it play out mm -hmm. in front of us. And, and uh, it was unfortunate, but, you know, yeah, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the, the key thing is really to pay attention to their behavior all the time. And if you feel that they are a little bit uncomfortable, you just back up. And a lot of the time, well, actually all the time, when you give them space and let them be comfortable, you get a lot better photos, right? You do. And, and so what, when I met Lydia, she had never been around bears. And so we went out and as an experiment, I was just showing her, we went out to the same spot. Yes, yeah. the bears, but instead of working our way around, we just let them know we were there, and we just sat in the in the one place, mm -hmm. and uh, we just observed them for an hour or two, mm -hmm. and then we got in our car and we left. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing for three weeks, mm -hmm. and then after three weeks, the mom realized we weren't interested in them at all. It was a mom and three. Yeah. She marched them right past us, mm -hmm. and walked right past where we were at. She didn't care. Mm -hmm. And then we just said, okay, that was cool. Snapped yeah. a few pictures, but we didn't, we, we took our time even getting out of the vehicle and moving around because we, we wanted them to just do their thing, be a bear. Mm -hmm. And, and then after that three weeks, she was walking them past us. And then I think I posted a photo that year. We were out off the trail and she saw us and she walked right up, laid down in the grass, a Kodiak bear and there's the cubs right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was amazing to see. It's because we didn't pose a threat to her, but we didn't want her to be habituated at the same time. So we maintained our distance and just, you know, photographed and observed, but it was a good learning experience of uh -huh. watching what bears do. And, and if you do that and really take the time, maybe watch some YouTube videos, but then get out and spend some time observing, it'll make you a better photographer because you can see what their behavior is and what they do. And you uh -huh. can anticipate a little bit without chasing. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. And oh, this is just suddenly thought about it because I was just uh, 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 sad when I heard about that. So did every spring they allow uh, hunting of bears still in Kodiak? Yeah, there's, um, they issue a certain number of tags based on the total uh, population of the bears and that's managed by Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Huh. So, so there's a, there's a local um, uh, road system tag, which I think there's, I don't know how many they're giving out this year. I haven't looked because I've been, I've been overseas for work. So I was uh -huh. a little busy, um, but they had, a, they issue a certain number for local Alaska residents and anybody who's not an Alaska resident who comes up to hunt uh -huh. has to hire a local experienced guide. Yeah. Uh, for uh -huh. hunting. Uh -huh. I see. I see. Wow. Okay. That's uh, wow. Well, I, I don't know. I, of course, you know, uh, my stance on those. So, uh, uh, um, so anyway, so um, right now I'll let John rest for a minute and look at the questions and then I'll jump on to talk a little bit about the photography part. How about that? And then we'll talk about more on your crazy encounter last winter and then we'll take some questions. Okay. So, um, so everybody, um, um, you, um, if you, the link, work for me okay um let me see um how do i say it so um, i'm gonna talk a little bit about uh photography in bears right? like, so you you guys all seen saw a lot of photos of bears mm -hmm. right and uh for me i am going to share with you how do you tell if a photo of a bear is a good photo or a bad photo or like any photo of a bear is a good photo right? of course we agree that yeah. <laughs> our life is good but you know i'm crazy right everybody <laughs> agree that tin man is crazy so I'm, I'm just very obsessed about uh the perfect photo and like a great photo and um and in the beginning when i saw a bear like 10 years ago i just uh, shoot non-stop a whole day thousands and thousands of photos but over the years 
I kind of uh, put together something that uh, you guys, when you next time when you go out to take photos of the, the bears, maybe you can pay attention to those few things, and it could probably improve uh, on your photos. And uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit on that for five minutes, and then uh, uh, and then yeah, and then I'll, I'll let John talk. So uh, let's go back to the uh, photos here. Da, 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 da. So. Um, Okay, <laughs> so um, so to photograph um, Alaska, like for bears in general, um, and I see that a lot of um, uh, photos out there, um, they have um, certain things, certain ingredients in the photos that uh, that's what I pay attention to when I tell if a photo is good or bad. So um, ready? So number one is uh, harsh light. So what I mean by that is uh, like when you go out and uh, if you go to Alaska, sometimes you go to Canmire, the, the working hours is say from nine to five for some of the, the guys and all. So sunrise is at six o'clock or some, uh, assume six o'clock, sunset is at like in Alaska summer, long day, sunset may be at 11 or 10 p.m. So if you go at 10 to five and it's, if it's a sunny day, um, the light is gonna be very harsh. And for animals that have like this long fur uh, with harsh light is gonna look really bad. Um, so for example, um, this photo kind of shows you that you see like the shadows, like the shadows and the, and the brightness, the highlights is very sharp, has this sharp difference. And so um, the, the, this is one of the problems that you, you should pay attention to. So when you look at other people's photos to learn and stuff just first of all look at uh, the the light right the, the harsh light is something that i see uh, happens in a lot of photos the second is um bears live like among the, the the greens right tall grass branches and and those and so when we take photos of the bears uh, we should try to avoid that um so this oh god okay so this is uh, one of the this is, so one of the like this is kind of the habitat that you usually see in Alaska or where the bears shows up. Do you know like um, like the tall grass and and those? Can you see that, John? You, you can yeah, see I can see that. that. Yeah. yeah. So this is one of the example. This is another example. So like this photo, you may think is okay, but like you know the background is just very distracting because of all this uh, uh, like clutter. And uh, even this one, you know, um, like you get you, another I mean, another thing. Is you you always get photo bombed by this kind of thing? What is that? It's a it's a go right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So you know, um, and then also like this kind of back, and then this this invisible lines and stuff. This is something that I always try to avoid. Uh, and also like this like darker and brighter spot and stuff. It it actually uh, I have actually tested it online for for quite a few years. Like with a clear photo, like clean photo, and photos with this, it it makes a huge difference if you can avoid that. Um, so finally, this is another th one thing that um, a lot of the beginning photographers, they may not be aware is imagine the bear is uh, pouncing in the river or in, in the in the in the ocean on the on the beach or something. Um, so what usually, uh, as John just mentioned about the, 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 the whale example, the um, uh, the water can come up like the ties come down and up and down and up and when the water the ties go down what happens is some of the sandy area will be exposed uh, in the in the water and sometimes when the bears so the bears have to wait for the water to be not too shallow to to look for salmon right because if it's too deep right you're gonna swim snorkel and then if it's like no water then there's no salmon so they have to wait for that special moment that's why getting photos of um, bears catching salmon and stuff is not as not not easy you have to time it the problem is when the water is kind of shallow you get a lot of those um, water banks like the, the sandy bar and stuff like that in the background and that can be like like even in this example you can see that this thing can be super annoying in 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 terms of a photo right? of course the encounter is lovely but but a lot of i, I talked to a lot of the photographers background is as important as the photo so you can see like this right these lines these lines here and especially the a line that is cutting across the body of uh, the bear it really reduced the visual impact of the photo um so like, like this is an example like these lines is caused by like when 
and the water is low and then this sand uh, shows up above the water and so for the longest time um, they, that is a problem that I thought is almost impossible to solve when you're photographing uh, bears. So so, uh, so to review, right, number one is the harsh light. Number two is uh, the clutter background, the, the grass and stuff. Number three is this, this, right, this nonstop line. So so over the years, um, so this also, like even though this is not too obvious, like, like now you can never unsee this, right, <laughs> in the future. Like all the photos that they look at is because it's very difficult to, 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 um, to avoid that. So what happens is, look at this. So, so in this last uh, year or two, I just I was in a quest with my group of uh, photographer friends and uh, guests and clients and students. We were always thinking about how do we make more impactful photos? You know, because if the photo is more impactful, have less of those distractions, people pay more attention to your photos. And at the end, they, they care more about the animals and that will just like they share them and people will know how beautiful they are. And then, you know, this kind of thing. So now, if you look at some of these photos, we use light, we use um, angle, different angles and stuff to avoid um, the line cutting across the, the body. And uh, and so, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to go in super depth about about the, the, the idea, but uh, but OK, so so this is uh, really the uh, the main idea of that. So everybody good with these three things? Uh, if you can repeat after me, <laughs> number one is what? Number one is pay attention to the harsh light. Uh, number two is um, number two is uh, what, what is that? The, the clutter, the tall grass and stuff. And number three is these lines not not hoping not to cut across the the thing so um finally before we end um so as I mentioned to to John, uh, to you guys before, I was asking, hey John, is it possible to even get photos of them in four colors and those? And and sometimes the bears go, go into hibernation. Sometimes you know um, um, you know um, you, they were just uh, the behavior. You have to be very experienced, very you have to have a very experienced guide with you to know to go in those time, right? So what happened last winter was uh, it was an unprecedented thing that happened. So let me tell you. So uh, some of my friends uh, would spend a lot of money, like I don't know, 10, 20 grand for a week uh, to go to a place uh, in Yukon. And in, in, in the last few years, this special place, uh, they have bears that would pounce, uh, like look for salmon in super cold weather. So they would come, like once the water pounce into the water, because the weather was so cold, when the bear comes up, it immediately, the water turns into frost. And then the face was like those uh, famous photos of the bison covered with frost, right? So people would spend $20,000, fly to Can Can the Canadian Arctic and go to a small village to, to do that. And I was saving my money too. Uh, that's why I teach all the classes. <laughs> this is one of the dream plays. And guess what happened last year? John was telling me that that was happening in Kodiak. And um, because, uh, I, I don't know if it's because of global warming or whatever reason, I don't know, but the bears were going to hibernation late. And think about it, John was living in Kodiak Island. So this is his backyard. And he was able to go out in late, late in the winter, like, um, was it in November? Uh, in November, we had a, a really big cold snap and Lydia and I were walking up the river a few times and we found the bears. Uh -huh. We were kind of keeping it quiet for a while, but I knew when somebody saw the car out there, they would know. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and and then the bears were much more active as they kept running back and forth with the uh -huh. uh, picking up fish. And then so they worked the upper part of the river and then everybody knew. And it, it was a good show for everybody because they, they stuck around for about you know, almost eight weeks uh -huh. out there fishing. And uh -huh. they were uh, they had a nice late silver salmon run. Mm -hmm. and they uh they allowed us some great photo ops yeah so now that i tell you the story and when you see this photo by john you know that this is like like if you have photographed bears for a few years you know that oh my god this is the once a lifetime shot because look at the frost 
And then he even get a freaking crazy background. So that makes me stop talking to him for quite a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, I was actually in Kenya at the time. And uh, but sometimes, you know, life is like that. John was supposed to come with me to Kenya uh, during that, that month. But some like because of work, he had to cancel like the last minute. But because yeah. of that, that you know, like then then the, the bears had this late run and then he was able to get those photos. So you, you never you never know about photography. Like life is just very interesting. So John, um, so so can you tell me how cold it was? Um, we recorded temperatures, I, at, and probably the other Kodiak people will know this as well. I think we broke a record for the coldest November uh, mm -hmm. we had. I mean, we were, I think on this day, we were close to zero. I think we we're about three degrees plus the, the wind blowing. It, and that's why when they're fur would freeze over is as the wind blew, you can actually hear it sounded like a little bit like a chandelier. Uh -huh. And uh, when they were shaking or when the wind was blowing. So it was, it was below zero with the wind chill back. Yeah, I see. And then one thing that I have, I always uh, talk to my students about is, um, you know, when um, there are like uh, mist, fog and uh, dust, uh, and rainbow, <laughs> you know, those special nature um, phenomena, if you can, or, or heavy raining or something like that, but like foggy and stuff, it always evoke a lot of emotion. And when you have those opportunity, those are once a lifetime. And guess what? John <laughs> got a photo of like a foggy day with the, the bear and the bear was like wearing like a like a helmet with the, the frost. And uh, so what happened that day, John? Can you tell us the story? Well, there was a, a large group of uh, what we call well-known uh, local photographers. We were out there and then the fog started rolling in and Lydia was standing next to one of the photographers, but I saw the bear walking up the river and I went, I've got to get that shot. So I made a, made a cruise up where they couldn't see me behind the alders and I came around and I dropped down to where I can get a shot from the bank Mm -hmm. up the river where she was walking and that's this is one of the several shots I was able to pull off mm -hmm. and the other photographer asked me later I, I didn't know what you were doing and then I showed her the back of my camera and she oh darn it <laughs> you always let you make people hate you <laughs> so this so this photo uh, what I see is uh, first of all this is a once a lifetime they were all covered and uh, and the head turn is really beautiful so looking at uh, the body is away but looking on on this side and then the water reflection has this Gold. This, is this called the salmon color? What is the color? Maybe Lydia yeah. now. <laughs> the color. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the, like a creamy kind of. Cre we'll use your favorite word, creamy. For yeah, moment. yeah. So it has the blue and the the, the kind of the gold. So it has a very beautiful um, tension and uh, like a very good angle. So this photo uh, was selected, right, John, uh, as one of the photos in the Remembering Bears uh, upcoming book, right? Yes. Yeah. So I want to congratulate you on that. So, uh, so for some of you, um, uh, is this showing up? God, my my computer is very slow. Can you see the the picture? Is that that new high speed Mac you got? That's I'm, um, I'm just I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I need money back. Um, so I think my cat can so, so this is the, the Remembering Bears. Uh, uh, do you have the link? I have the link, I'll, I'll post it later. Um, so so this is the um, uh, the um, the Kickstarter founded by uh, British photographer uh, Margot. Um, and so, so currently it has raised $165,000 in just a few days and here's a few more days. So what you do is uh, they collect all the best photos uh, from around the world. Photographers would donate the photo and then they put it into a beautiful book. And when you buy the book, the money that they made, uh, minus of course the cost of printing and stuff, uh, they will put those money into uh, conservation. I don't know about the details of the conservation, probably um, like we can learn more from their websites, but um, do you know, John? I don't know right off the top, but I, I, Margo's gonna be up with me in about uh, a month. So I'll, I'll make sure I get all the good details by then. Yeah, yeah, you can, um, you can, you can share, share with uh, with the people, and um, and so yeah, this is a very meaningful thing. And I mean, I just can't believe that, like you know, a, a hobby, a passion of photography can actually turn out to be helping uh, the 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 animals that we love the most, right? And I was very uh, uh, fortunate and honored that this photo was uh, um, selected as well.
well uh, with John's photo of this one. So, um, um, so yeah, so yeah, so that um, that kind of sums up what we are talking about um, today. And um, and because you know, I was just talking to John a few days ago. Nothing was really uh, it, uh, confirmed, but I said I. Like, John, you have all these crazy encounters and stuff. Why don't we come up together with like some crazy, crazy trip for photographers who are really into getting some amazing ones, a lifetime shots, like not for like, like just, just for those super obsessed people <laughs> on that. Uh, and just because he has experience with uh, some of the best pilots over the years um, or in Alaska. And I, uh, but then nothing is really confirmed. We just wanted to come up with a plan to go on to some of the amazing places and get the lights like what, what we are talking with the light avoiding the lines the lights the 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 the, the distracting backgrounds and get some good photos but uh, nothing is really serious now but um we decided that uh, we, we just put up a link where you can uh, put in your name and email and we'll just keep you updated about uh, the progress of our plan and if there is actually a trip because and you're not joining the trip you just kind of join that list and then we'll keep you updated and also i think John has some link on the PDF and then all this, uh, like the safe bear safety PDF and then all this info, and we are gonna uh, send it to you. I'll post the link uh, in a in a bit. Somebody, somebody had posted. There's a safety video, and I know Drew commented on it, and I agree with Drew. It's it's a okay. it's an excellent uh, bear safety video. Yeah, uh, I forgot. I saw. I don't remember who it was that posted it, but I know the video. Oh, that's then, fantastic, Drew. Yeah, I would love to meet Drew. And Drew is a very experienced uh, bear guy and photographer, and I've seen a lot of his photos. So Drew, Drew's a really nice guy. So. Okay, okay, that 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 is awesome. So so yeah, hi Drew. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I remember Drew has some like big beard, right? <laughs> the wild man beard, right? Is that so? Anyway, so this is the, the link um, to the thing. So we're still kind of putting together something, nothing confirmed. So this is kind of like a list, like, so that you can tell tell us what what is the the photos that you dream to get, so that we'll see if uh, we can come up with something, and um, and then also, oh God, I don't have the the I don't I haven't uploaded the PDF that you sent me. So let me let me just share with uh, uh, you again on the, uh, on the we'll go into Q&A in a bit. Yeah. But, uh, so, so this is the, the the list. So we just want to want you to send us the email so that we will we will just like, like I think these are just optional questions. Just tell us a little bit about uh, like are you also also because some of the time we hike and uh, like in Hollow Bay, like I remember we have to hike a few miles. So we also need to know how is your physical condition, and uh, and then we can plan something accordingly. That should be fun. I don't know. Um, and uh, and also John sent me these two links. Said can you. Tell 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 us more about about the the guy. So you sent me two PDF, right? Well, I, I got this information uh, from the uh, bear biologist I know in in Kodiak, and he uh, gave me the links. And then there's the former bear biologist Larry Van Deel is a great resource, and he wrote a lot of these papers. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, the fear, the don't how to deal with uh, close encounter, yeah, awesome. Just, and, just good, just good reference material, and you know in getting out and getting out in in the on the trails and and yeah. experimenting with uh different places you just it helps you remember what to do mm -hmm. yeah so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna upload to my uh google drive and then uh with and then because i have everybody who register for the zoom so i'll email you guys uh the link to download these two guys and also the the link to the page and um and and so so that 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 will that that, that is kind of like a nice review and more ad, additional information about pair safety because today we just kind of touch on like the, the the essential stuff and personal experience so um so yeah so that that is that so let's go into q a the most exciting q a all right <laughs> okay so candy <laughs> candy asks cody bears are said to be the largest in the world why is that <laughs> Well, that has to do, and in, in that document does explain it, but that has to do mainly with their geographic location. They have an excellent supply of food, so they, they're not having a struggle for uh, food supply as much as a, an interior grizzly or a Montana grizzly is going to do. Um, their food sources are limited, their berries and and uh, things like that for the interior, but in Kodiak and along the coast, you have salmon, you have 
you know, deer carcasses that happen and other carcasses. You have uh, the sedge grasses, the uh, goose tongue, uh, that's drawing a blank here, but several different types of berries that they can fatten up on. Mm -hmm. Just many, many food sources. Uh, uh, so why so why are they bigger than the Kenmire bear, for example? The Kenmire is right across the, the ocean, right? Uh, uh, on the other, on the- in, on it's, the it's, it's mostly having to do, like I said, with the geographic location, the food sources that they have. Well, uh, Kenmire has similar, Kodiak is actually a bit warmer Mm -hmm. uh, and on the island, we, we are a bit warmer, so they have a longer period of time to graze as well. Interesting, I see. Yeah, so geographic location makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. So when you when we went to Lake Clark, for example, to take photos of the bears and also Kenmai, do you see like a significant difference that you can even see it from the viewfinder that they are a lot bigger? It's, um, you can, it, we always say that the the Katmai bears, the coastal browns and the Lake Clark, they're more built like a tank. They're more wide and stout. Uh -huh. And the Kodiaks tend to be a little bit more longer legged and their skull is just a little bit longer. And, wow. Yeah, so, their snout. so their snout's a little bit different. But if you look at that picture of the, um, of the, um, yeah, that Kodiak guy put the, oh. So here's a Kodiak bear. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, when I took the shot straight on, he was, you can see I shot it wide open because oh, that's your photo. Okay. this is my photo. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and so when I took it, he's a nine and a half foot plus bear. So he, Holy cow. I shot him wide open. So when I took it wide open, you can see everything sharper, but in the back, it's, it's uh, beyond the focus plane. That's how big he was. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But uh, the snout is different. The, the skull is just a little bit different, and it, it's, I won't go into all the details because it, it'll bore most people. But uh, mm -hmm. we pay attention to that, and so they're a little bit longer legged. The, the coastal bears seem to be a little bit more squat, and, mm -hmm. and I, I use the word stout. Mm -hmm. So the basically, we just have to go to Kodiak to photograph them someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I and then I, I know British Columbia also have a lot of uh, brown bears too. So I wonder yeah. if uh, they, 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 they are different and, and stuff. So that that would be. I'll, I'll put another document out there later to share that explains and details the difference between the, the browns and by geographic region. It shows mm -hmm. a map and then uh, that came from from a couple of different sources as well. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. That'll be, that'll be helpful to those who might be traveling to different spots to photograph just bears. Mm -hmm. I see. So um, okay. So this. Uh, thanks. So the second question by Judy: How far away can a bear smell us? My. Well, that depends on how bad you smell. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, it depends on a lot of things. Wind direction. If you're if you're. Uh, if you're upwind, downwind, uh, uh, what you have on you, what you're what you're carrying, are you wearing skin lotion or something like that? It just just depends. Are you in a campsite cooking? They mm -hmm. can smell quite a long ways away. Mm -hmm. uh, we always say a bear can smell when you're out hunting deer. They could smell that two miles away, the blood from it. So, and it's a lot further than that. There's been documented cases where they smelled a lot further than that, so. Oh yeah, I was just talking to a good friend and I think uh, like um, they were kind of subsistence and, and they, 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 they would hunt uh, elk for their food sauce and stuff. And then one time, like, I, I just like the, the the moment when they have to carve the meat, um, it, it, it the bears can come. Right? So those are the time when they have to do it very quickly, and it can be yeah. very dangerous too, right? Yeah. yeah, I see, I see. So okay, so um, Barbara, will this be available later? I need to okay, so th it will be recorded. So Donna, hey, in Jasper, they all say to keep your dogs on on leash when walking. Very good, very good point. Don't and let your dogs off the leash, so. Um, I always recommend when I go hiking and I love dogs and when I'm out hiking, I don't, uh, even growing up, I didn't bring a dog with me just because it attracts the bears. Bears do not like dogs and dogs don't like bears. And if you read every bear safety thing, it's in the top seven items. It says, do not bring a dog if you don't have to. That's crazy because you remember we were hiking in Anchorage on the trail and yeah. 
And then we ran into a lady with the dog, and then you were telling her that I, I, careful, there is a there is a bear. And then she said, "Don't worry, I have my dog with me." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and so it it's just because of the relationship with dogs and bears, and it's um, the reason why is you. It's not saying that the, some dogs aren't better than others with it. It just it might trigger the bear or if the dogs off the leash, like Donna said. It can run ahead, and we had an incident in Kodiak about four or five years ago where the guy was out hiking at, at the end of the road in a place we call Anton Larson uh, Bay, and he had hiked up the one trail, and his dog was off the leash. Well, the dog came running back down the trail with the bear right behind him, and, then, and the guy got uh, charged. He got knocked down, uh, had an injury. I don't remember if it was um, maybe Jerry. I know she's on there would remember, but I don't remember if he actually got bit by the bear or just knocked down and had an injury, but um it was a case where the dog was off the leash and brought the bear back to it we just saw that happen in montana a few years ago there was a mauling that was similar to that it does happen and that's why they say uh better not to have that happen if I you see. can avoid it so the dog is like look what i brought you <laughs> yeah look i got a new friend <laughs> <laughs> i see okay so <laughs> all right so uh yeah that that answer so, so yeah you know donna so uh ja asked hey ja um can you teach us when and how to use the bear spray yeah you, you demonstrated a little bit but if you can tell so there's a safety right there's a safety button so I'm not going to pop the safety off just in case because I'm, I'm really jet lagged from flying a lot. And I've, I've watched more people out in the last couple of years spray themselves when putting the safety back on. Oh, wow. Okay. So you have to be really careful to make sure you get it on because some people have a tendency to push down when they're doing this. And I don't know if Drew's had this happen before, but I watched the one lady and I said, you might want to go underneath that a little bit. And right when I said that, she had already pushed it down and let off a burst and got it on her on her hand and then uh -oh. made for a bit of an unpleasant experience for her. But you want to slide the safety off. Uh -huh. You want to, you know, you're not going to aim it up in the air. You're going to point it down. So when the bears, uh -huh. if they're running at you, you want them to, to come into the cloud. And do you, do you engage like half a bottle or just play this? Just the, just the burst is all you should just do. The burst. You just like a couple burst and you can see it going out. It'll, it has a, like a dye in there that you can see it coming out. I see. That's and, and, then, uh -huh. and then what's really uh, interesting to watch with bear behavior, we had a, a bear, um, for those who are from Kodiak or have been to Alaska, but there was a, the one river that runs by the, the airport. It's called the Buskin River, and there's mm -hmm. people fishing down there. And a bear was harassing them, meaning he was somebody had given up their fish, so mm -hmm. he was trying to get more free fish. Uh -huh. And the one guy just pulled out his bear spray. And as soon as he saw the red canister, he was gone. And I said, that bear has been sprayed before. Interesting. Wow. They're, they're so smart. They knew, yeah. they knew what was coming next. Uh -huh. Another guy had just hit the, hit the spray and it, it gives a stink sound when mm. it's rushing out, you know, and I, I won't try and, and imitate it, but when the sound came out, the bear was gone instantly. Uh -huh. I see. Wow. So to to me, I mean, um, just please correct me if I'm completely, absolutely, disgustingly wrong. But it almost feels like um, when you can still see the bear and use the bear spray, usually it's very effective because they know you are there. They were just kind of testing it and trying to come come off. But if you are like uh, stepping on their cash or surprise them in the corner and then like uh, of a mama bear with the cubs and then they are defending themselves by coming out, then even if you spray it, it almost like there's a chance that it wouldn't even stop them. Like, well, and you want to once you deploy spray you want to exit the area if you can but when you step up on onto a, a cache of food cache or storage uh, uh -huh. in this case a carcass or um we had an incident in kodiak it wasn't wasn't last year it was a year before so it was in 2020 where the an older man who runs the uh, local hardware store was he runs up a mountain we call pillar mountain which is where the town is nestled underneath it's a uh -huh. it's the mountain right in town and he always ran and Lydia and I had been up the mountain the day before and we saw him running with his headphones on. And I said, gosh, he shouldn't run with his headphones on. The next day we heard the sirens and he had gotten attacked by a mom bear with three spring cubs. And she was defending her thing. He came running by and she saw running, which what does a bear do when they see something running? It's either prey or it's a threat. Mm -hmm. And she knocked him down. And instead of staying down, he got right back up and 
she knocked him down again and then gnawed on him. I can't remember if it was his leg or his arm. It was, it was, it was, I think it was his arm on the back of his arm. And so he then reached for his spray and sprayed her and got him off of him. And then he dialed 911. Oh, wow. so that's a case where he did what you're not supposed to do, but it worked out for him mm -hmm. and probably saved his life. Wow. Because, uh, when he got up, he was now prey and then the, the bear was on him. She was in defense mode, but they, they didn't put her down because it was a defensive attack, which uh -huh. I think somebody mentioned that. And it's, it's true. A lot of them are defensive attacks. Um, not saying there's not going to be an offensive attack. I don't want to be involved in one of them if I can help it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I've heard people say, well, I'll just outrun it. And I said, well, that, you're not going to outrun a bear. It's uh -huh. not going to happen. They, uh, Kodiaks and grizzly will run up to 35 and 40 miles an hour in a short burst. Uh -huh. and, and you don't want to try and outrun them. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe I still remember seeing somebody in Grand Teton National Park that, like, in the in the like not on the road, but like in, in the, on on the in the field, and then they were running with just like a running shots and like a like a top, and that's it, like nothing, no phone, no nothing, and they're just running and head and say, "This is fair country," and I think they just reported some sightings right near there, and. People, I think a lot of people think, oh, might not like I will take the chance. It's not going to happen. Like ninety nine percent of the time, it's not going to happen. In, 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 in all fairness, it's uh, bear attacks and bear fatalities are rare. I mean, uh -huh. like I said at the beginning, bears generally will leave you alone, and yeah. they don't want anything to do with you as much as you don't want anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the best thing you do whole... is yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the best thing you do. It's going to like it always comes down to location and and where you're at. Yeah. So if you're in cat mine in open field, the bear has a chance to see you, smell you, and mm -hmm. you know, okay, it's another person. I'm okay. Does that mean you're any safer there? No, because um, when people ask me if I'm, uh, are they going to be more safer in cat mine? I said, generally you are, but there's bad bears everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not saying there's a whole ton of them, but you know, like with humans, there's bad people and there's good people, and most bears are tolerant, and that's I I know that through some training and uh, bears are tolerant of us more than we are of them, I think. And they, they allow us to come into their world. And that's the way I look at it. They allow us to come into their world. And I'm glad they're tolerant because from what I've seen over the years, it, it's, it's, uh, I'm really glad they're tolerant. Yeah, I mean, I mean, seriously, I, I think uh, about 10 years ago, I still remember that shocking encounter. So we were in Yellowstone. Uh, photographing a, a grizzly on a slope and all the photographers were like a hundred yards away you know like across the road like be on in the field like photographing a bear on the other side of the slope like a hundred yards everybody were happy and stuff and the bear was just grazing the grass and then out of nowhere there is a vehicle that just driving and then like break right stop right in front of the bears and there comes a young couple and they came out walk to the bear and then do a selfie with the bears and they walk back to the car and you know sometimes i think the bears would just like realize how stupid they are and then they don't even bother to eat them <laughs> yeah we we always tell you don't turn your back on a bear i mean somebody asked me that they said i noticed even though you're out here all the time you don't you don't turn your back on the bear i said i never do why mm -hmm. why tempt why tempt fate when you don't have to pay attention to your surroundings at all times yeah it's better for you and it's better for the bear yeah, yeah, totally. So uh, one from anonymous attendee, how do you maintain safety while back country backpacking in the Cascades? Cascades, is it in like uh, Washington uh, state maybe? Uh-huh, probably. Yeah. How do you maintain? Well, that's a pretty generic um, question. So uh, I'm assuming they're hiking the mountain trails by that statement, but um, it's the same thing you're going to do no matter if you're in the Cascades or you're um, in any other mountain mountain trail. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the in the Cascades, perhaps the, the bear density isn't as great as maybe in other places, but you, that's no reason to be complacent. Mm -hmm. It only takes one bear and one encounter to change things forever. Yeah. You and, you. and that's what I always talk about. Even if you've been in the same place a hundred times and you've made it in and out a hundred times, doesn't mean you're going to come out unscathed in, in the 101st time. Same thing that people talk about with speeding in their car. Well, I always drive faster here because I've mm -hmm. done it 400 times. Well, the next day they get a ticket. 
Uh -huh. you, know, you, you can't take things for granted. And the yeah. moment you take things for granted, that's when stuff seems to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to be remembered in one of those Darwin videos of any kind. You know, mm -hmm. or things yeah. happen. Somebody did something really stupid out there. Yeah. So you, you've got to maintain safety practices all mm -hmm. the time. And that's that's hard to get across because we all want to take the quick, easy path, but sometimes uh -huh. it's not so quick and easy. Okay, so assume that, like, for example, I'm the one who are hiking, who are hiking in the Cascades and they're, 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 they're wearing the backpack and and then I step, crap, like I step, I hear some branches and there was a carcass right behind where I'm stepping on. What do you do? Uh, I would send uh, a text. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, Goodbye, right? Yeah, exactly. No, what, what you do next is probably going to determine everything for you. If you hear that crack and you just stepped over a carcass, um, if you can, you want to exit the scene, back up and get out of there. But if, as long as the bear's not behind you. Um, do you still make noise at the time or do you just quickly you, get around? If you don't see the bear start backing up out of the area, but if the bear's made himself known, you want to start talking and getting out of that situation. You want to become the world's best negotiator at that point. You just keep talking to the bear. You never want to raise your voice. You want to keep calm, talk like we are right now. Uh -huh. That believe it or not, reassures a bear and can def de uh, fuse the situation mm -hmm. faster. Is it going to work with every bear? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I can't answer that because every bear is different, just like every person is different. And that's why you want to always give the bear an out, mm -hmm. give yourself an out so that you don't, you don't want to corner a bear. You don't want to um, get the bear to where it thinks it's trapped. And then it's a fight or, uh, fight or flight situation. And um, that's always 50, 50. And, you know, I don't necessarily want to put myself in that situation. I see. But those are usually the, the dangerous situation, right? Yes. Yes. I see. And, and like I said before, on a trail versus an open field, it's a completely different uh, experience. Oh, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so when you encounter a bear on the trail, you want to kind of, I know in Brooks Camp, they teach you, uh, you know, back up and give the bear the trail. But a lot of times the bear will still follow you because, hey, what are you doing over there? And then, and then but then they'll wander on by. Yeah. So that's why I say it's what you do and how you keep yourself calm. I mean, you just got to keep yourself calm so that you don't become prey for the bear. You don't want to become the bear's interest. Uh -huh. I see. Because yeah. if you scream or mm -hmm. take your voice up too high of an octave, they might interpret that entirely different than we would as a human. I see. Mm -hmm. I see. It's, so it's kind of counterintuitive when you are in danger, you have to keep calm. <laughs> yes. Oh. How you how you handle the situation. Yeah. Your legs are shaking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely it's an adrenaline cranking moment, you know, there's there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Donna asked about the bear bells. So you 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 didn't you said you didn't know, right? But it should a lot of people do that. A lot of people do it. I've seen people put them on their dogs. And I, I think any noise that lets the bear know you're around is probably good. I don't. I haven't used bear bells myself, so I don't have mm -hmm. any real life experience with it. I know a lot of people do. Yeah, uh -huh. I see. I see. So Keith asks, is it advisable to get professional advice on practice discharging bear sprays at distance and where to aim? Um. A lot of communities offer offer that where they have the, I think they call it, I think the word is inert, inert, I-N-E-R-T, inert uh, spray. So the, it doesn't have the, the, uh, the pepper in it so that you can learn, but it has the coloration so you can see how it disperses and how to do it. Uh, I know in Kodiak, they do it in other communities in Alaska. I've yeah. read where they do it in places near Yellowstone as well. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Things you don't want to do is, um, there was a well-documented story, I think I told you about this, where there was a, a foreign uh, family from Asia that had come to Yellowstone and had uh, bought uh, four cans of bear spray and they thought it was like mosquito repellent. They walked out, sprayed their two, two children and themselves and they all ended up in the hospital. And uh, it was just a little bit lost in translation, but it, those kind of things can happen. Yeah. yeah, first you put on the sunblock, right? And the next yeah. is the spray. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah the... <laughs> so okay. it's in a lot of things we take for granted, maybe somebody wouldn't, and they would think it was like a, another type of repellent as opposed to spray. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then a lot of people might not know how powerful they are, right? Like, okay. Yeah. So, um, Adriana, I have a can of bear sprays that just expired. Would it be yes. to practice yes. spraying on with that as long as I know where the wind is coming from? Absolutely. Wouldn't expire it even better? So they smell bad and they smell strong. Sorry about that. I, just have to I would, when I go out, I always carry two cans anyway. Uh, as long as you have a backup plan in case it doesn't work. I see. Oh, you, you carry two? I always carry two. Wow. Yeah. I see. I see. Just in case one isn't working. Uh huh. I see. See, I mean, sometimes. Um, That's the engineer in me. <laughs> no, no, no. I think that is very a very interesting perspective. That for you who are very experienced with bears, you have seen different encounters, and you didn't take it lightly. Like, oh, okay, I, I'm more comfortable. I know their behavior. I should do it. And instead, you, 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 you bring two. I, I pride myself at not having to use it, but at the same time, you have to be prepared. And when you have people out there with you, you uh -huh. have to make sure that you know in a pinch you could have somebody else. You know, if there's a, you know, just I, I, I like to think of it as a worst case scenario as it, as it's going to happen. You know, if, if one doesn't work, I want to have another one that might work should we need. Yeah, I think it's actually very important, especially sometimes you go with a bunch of friends and then, you know, the peer pressure is, oh, come on, right? Like, it's okay. <laughs> and then, you know, you always see those people wearing like flip flops and sandals while hiking into the field. They, they don't have air spray. I think you just have to really believe in yourself and know what is the right thing to do. In when guiding, though, I don't take people out that have flip flops on just because of the safety issue. It's, uh, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's proper gear, or no, no go. Well, at least you know they, they can run, right? So, yeah. 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 Okay. So Samantha has a bear is active from October to March in the southwest Utah, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, places that will be camping uh, with a fifth wheel uh, wheeler. I would say more uh, boom docking over being in the campground. So kind of freelancing it out there. Okay. Yeah. Um. I went to school in the Southwest, but it's, um, if the bears, I would assume are active because it's pretty warm out there. I, I don't, I don't know as much about the Utah, New Mexico, Nevada bears, mm -hmm. but in Arizona, I know there are black bears out there uh -huh. and, um, bears are bears. If there's a food source, they might come knocking on your door and see if they can borrow a cup of sugar or something. You know, you just don't want to, you want to always be prepared. Um, yeah. I would check if if you had questions. Uh, good good resources are the local fishing game, mm -hmm. fish and wildlife. Uh, yeah, yeah. National yeah. parks, uh, and and that's another thing that I always emphasize when you're going out to someplace you don't know. Mm -hmm. plan, plan your trip out and check about regulations and safety issues in the area. I mean, there's a lot of resources you can use to check that. Yeah, a couple, a couple of Google searches you can find that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably better to call the rangers station. Yeah, and... you can call fishing game in the areas where you're going and just ask them if they're active or send them a, mm -hmm. a message. They probably have a link on their page where you can do uh, that, that out. Yeah. yeah. And talking about back to the bear spray thing, uh, I think so for me, uh, what I would do is every time I go to Alaska uh, or, or, or like Yellowstone area, I would just see it as like an like an insurance. You just go to the grocery store and buy like one or four. From now, from now on, I probably buy two bottles after John <laughs> mentioned to me. You you buy buy it new, and then you just bring it out when you um, go hiking. Um, but also be careful. I think I heard one of my friends mention that like sometimes if you put it inside the vehicle, it may they got mm -hmm. discharged and then like, like you, you know for, for play in Denali uh, if you take those bus in Denali National Park they didn't even allow you to bring the bear spray inside the vehicle because you know one yeah. drop can like the, the vehicle can just go off the, the slope because the drivers can't breathe can't see right yeah mm -hmm. yeah but what I was saying is that you buy it new and bring two bottles in and then when you you finish the, the tour you just give it to the hotel front desk right and then you can help other people and that one like one one bottle is like 50 bucks or something right yeah yeah i think that that is uh that is a really good investment for for that yeah and, yeah. yes 
Yeah, totally. Because oh, so, so the thing is, uh, I was gonna say is, uh, I've heard that like one swipe of a, a brown bear, they can kill a moose, something like that, right? Is it? Like they're super powerful, basically. They're very powerful, yeah. Yeah, and then you, you just don't have a chance when they, for example, like unfortunately, like, just touch wood. But if there's a, an attack, like they swipe and then your shoulder is gone, and then like half of the face is gone, and you know, with a hundred bucks, at least you have <laughs> like a chance. But uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. better to have deterrent than not have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is uh, that is good. And then Dave mentioned, what are your recommendations for being safe when photographing polar bears? Well, I'm assuming you're on a guided tour when you're out there, unless you have some special uh, permits or something. But I know in Alaska, you have to, uh, it's been shut down for the last couple of years. And, mm -hmm. But then there's people like Drew who guide up in uh, Churchill right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, talk to Drew. Drew. Is Drew still here? <laughs> hopefully Drew's still on there. I, I, it's hard for me. My my trip to go out with polar bears was canceled due to when they had the COVID start. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. For, for for my limited uh, experience photographing uh, brown bear and uh, and polar bear, uh, for polar bear they. Um, like they, they, they are very kind of uh, sneaky. They like, yes. you keep taking photo of them, they look at you and then they zigzag, but then you, you realize that all of a sudden like, oh, they are much closer. <laughs> so they're yeah. getting closer and closer and closer. But then the, the same thing is uh, when the guy like clap their hands and talk to them, they actually would still back up too. So it's all about the attitude as well. But I mean, I'm, I'm no experts in there, but I just see that for brown bear, they just leave you alone, right? Like you yeah. photograph them, they keep the distance and all, but polar bear they have a tendency to but maybe it's just the polar bears that i photograph i don't know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and uh yeah also on the on the bear spray somebody had asked in a separate question about how do we keep the the um bear spray on a small aircraft when we're flying over we put it in a in the floats we have an opening in the floats and i put it in a in a sealed bag as well to keep it in there. Yeah, but for, for commercial airline, you are not allowed yeah. to bring it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so do never, never bring it. Oh, Tin Man and John told me to get bear spray, so I bought like a whole luggage there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. So, so that's why I said always go to the location and then go to the grocery yeah. stores uh, after you get your vehicle to buy it new. Yeah, because you never bring it out. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, like just a little bit of leakage, like the, the plane goes down because you know, like people can breathe can see and is very critical to so it's kind of like uh, also you know like this conflict right you have yeah. to bring it but you can bring it there and some of the small planes uh, like you, you, you also you can bring on the small plane unless they have a flow and then you hang it out there yeah 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 so yeah that is actually a very interesting thing on, on that point so thanks Cha about that um, and Dave what are your okay put a bear Carol how do you get a great picture of a bear but keep it from coming at you <laughs> uh, you invest in a super telephone <laughs> yeah, 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 super telephoto and also um, a guy as I mentioned to you um, it's all about um, understanding the, the behavior of the bear. You give them space, you give them the respect and and watch their behavior all the time. Right? I'm just kind of... Um, like, it is. It, it comes down to the, the the bear and you and how you interact with them and, uh, and, and uh, giving them their space is critical. Uh -huh. and, then, and then my favorite saying, I'll go back to it again, is let the bear be the bear. I've been saying uh -huh. that since uh, one of the bear biologists when I was very young said that to us. He goes, the secret is let the bear alone, let the bear be a bear. Uh -huh. and, and it's very true because the bear is gonna decide a lot of what happens out there. Uh -huh. As much as we think we have as uh, control of it, our behavior definitely influences what happens. Yeah. But the bear, if the bear is fishing and it's not gonna pay attention to you, it'll run right past you if he's actively uh -huh. fishing. And you have to anticipate those moments like you always say to a man it's, it's anticipation and putting yourself in the position to get the shot and you you have to do that it comes with experience and getting mm -hmm. out wildlife so it's it, it takes some effort but it's the payoff is well worth it 
Yeah, so it, it, this is actually the main reason we have this talk is like I have photographed bears for the last 10 years and never once I feel threatened or like like something that I, I'm like fearing for my life. However, I have seen uh, from forums and news news reports. I, I remember a few years ago, I saw a post about uh, one of the attacks in, uh, was it in Yellowstone or somewhere? I forgot, but like they, they were talking about a photographer that was killed by a bear and then they retrieved the, the photos from his camera and they, the photographer was keeping from a distance and then the, the bear kept coming close and then the last photo was when the bear just the, the, he, the bear was grazing the grass but the last photo was the bear uh, looking up at him and then you know like they, and then he was like, like partially consumed when they discovered that so like so that's why you know one is one thing is uh, don't go alone in the back country, I think. And second yeah. is understand what John was talking about. Like, like think about their food sauce before you go, right? Like, <laughs> right? Don't go two weeks after the, their primary food sources is finished for the year. <laughs> yeah, like if you go like in the time right after the hibernation, you just storm in alone and they haven't eaten for three or four months. And, the, you know, like that that you, you're getting yourself into trouble. Not to say that all the bears are like that, because I, one thing very important is I don't want to paint a bad picture for bears because, I mean, we, we love bears and we have, and, and the reason is we want people to pay their respect when they go to the field to know what is the right distance so that we can coexist and when we get good photos instead of uh, getting into any of those attacks and nobody wants that and then eventually the, the i care about the bears being even nice more so. <laughs> yeah i i what what lydia and i do and what i've been fortunate enough to I, I won't make this long but what we've done when we've gone out is if we have an experience with a bear and we're having some good shots uh -huh. I'll get the shots I want and then we exit the area because yeah. I want that bear to be relaxed when I got there and when I leave. Uh -huh. And because, you know, if I've stressed out the bear, the next person spots and goes, Hey, there's a bear. And he goes, oh, I'm not having it. And just runs at them. You yeah. know, you, you, it's better for the bear and better for you. And I found that that's how I'm able to get some of the shots that I get is by entering into the area, uh -huh. the, the bear and I have the, what I call the photo shoot, and then we exit out of the area and leave the bear alone. That that is so important. Yeah, you basically back out and say thank you, bear, and then and that's um, exactly what I do. <laughs> yeah, I know because a lot of the like, especially the newer like the beginners, what they would do is, oh, maybe I could get a little bit closer. I will get a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Eventually, the bear doesn't feel comfortable. They slowly walk away, and. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, done. And then you, you pack up, but you didn't realize that this is the, the we leave, left our footprint there. We are affecting it, but you know, go there, just like what John said, take a few photos and give them the space and thank, thank you for that amazing experience and let them do what they do. And then you are a successful photographer. I think that is really like a compliment to all the photographers if they can do it. And a lot of the time we were just into the moment and we forget, right? Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Cool. So you still have time, right, John, for a few more oh, questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what is considered a mating season in Alaska from Neil? Well, typically it's uh, May and June, but we've seen a mating in middle of July. I mean, it's just, uh, I guess like people when they're in the mood, I mean, I, I guess it's uh, springtime happens a little longer for some bears. I, I don't, I don't know. Uh huh. Okay. Those are the typical times. Mm hmm. I see. So is you sh so uh, okay. Uh, I think I, I understand Neil's question is so after the hibernation, uh, like uh, after the period of the hibernation, is it usually the the big males will come out first and then they look for females before the the and then they they have all the grass and whatever they they typically, they, typically the males are out first before the the sows and especially. Uh, sounds with cubs they come out later but uh yeah typically they're out they come out early uh -huh. and then the really the really big dominant boar seem to show up at mating time and you know they're feeding and and when we've had whale carcasses the past two years it makes for a very cool dynamic uh -huh. and, wow. and so what we saw what we saw last year and i know drew guides in katmai as well as as well as many other places and uh we saw an abundance of spring cubs last last year and it could we were thinking it could be because there was such a plentiful food source the year before with that humpback well which provided oh, okay. early season fattening up i mean we saw uh -huh. bears in in uh -huh. june that were at august weight it was crazy uh -huh. i see you know, 
Uh -huh. and, and and a thing that's known about the females before they hibernate, if they have made it successfully, the, it doesn't mean they're going to have it. They have to carry enough weight into hibernation in order mm -hmm. to have they actually have the the cubs. Uh -huh. If they're underweight, though, their body will absorb it and they will mm -hmm. not have them. I see. Yeah, John make a, a very good point. And for some of you who don't know, it's fascinating about bears. I just learned a few years ago too. Is like when John mentioned about the whale carcass and when the bears have a lot of uh, uh, food supply. So when they go into hibernation, I think right, right John, please correct me. Yeah. If I'm wrong. No, yeah. The females can decide how many babies they they are gonna have. Like they can say, okay, I have so much food source, so the hibernation I can provide these nutrients. I'm gonna have a quadruplets. <laughs> so, it's wired into them that uh, if they come in, say they're they're underweight to their ideal weight for having the the cubs, uh -huh. their body will absorb the uh, fertilized egg because it's in a suspended state. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So I'll, I'll put a link out there from it explains it. It's um, I can't remember which. There was a like a Disney nature thing that was out with uh -huh. uh, with bears and stuff a while back that explained it pretty well, but. Basically, what happens if they don't carry enough weight into hibernation time, they're not going to have the cubs. Uh -huh. Their body will absorb it and they'll go on to businesses. Uh -huh. And then the following year, they'll probably go right back into estrus. Interesting. So um, let me ask, sorry, it's got into become a biology <laughs> session. No, no, I just, it's just. Uh, no, no, no. So assume, for example, uh, some of you know that uh, the, the famous bear 399 in in, uh, in Grand Teton in Jackson, uh, she has four cups, uh, four, uh, four uh, quads, that's what they call. So uh, I, my question to John is um, when a bear has four cups, um, would it be possible that all four cups were coming from different fathers? Yes. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it is crazy. We had a we had a, a, a bear in Katmai this year with four cups. Uh-huh. So so now my question back to you is that this is the main reason of the question. So some of you know that um, so a lot of the inner inner action and photography uh, that I, I always like to take those is um, when the mother is uh, uh, with the cubs and then when they see a male coming, the adult male, they will usually be very nervous because, uh, and what they will do is they will stand up, look around for the exit route and then bring the cubs and get away from the male because the adult male bears would want to kill the cubs so that they can mate with the females again, right? So my question is, so if the, the, the bear has four cups and maybe one of the cups or, or maybe all the cups were actually from this male bear, would they know that, okay, this is my baby, I'm not going to kill it, or they don't care? They, uh, they will kill their own cubs to mate again. Wow, okay. So because they, they have no idea. They just, uh, it's all about the... I don't think it's about no idea. I think it's just about biology at that point. Um, they just want to mate and put their their uh, their offspring out there again. They'll, they'll kill their own. They're, they don't disseminate from that. Mm -hmm. And then there were uh, stories about... Um, like um, if the mother bear and the cubs, um, the mother bear may have like a sister and she also have cubs. They may be they taking care of them together or something. I think there was that like a record or something like, I think somebody was telling me about that in Kenmai one year. Yeah, that, I'm trying uh, to remember when that was. Uh, I've heard the story too. I, it, I think it depends on the bears. I mean, even if they are siblings, I think it just depends on uh, the nature, the behavior of the bears. I mean, the, there are some bears that don't like their uh, their own siblings. You know, <laughs> I mean, think about it with people too. It's the same thing. But I, I I know the story, and I I guess it happens. Yeah. Yeah, and then Robin said, great question. So Robin, you're a little bit crazy like me. to <laughs> think about this weird <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I, 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 oh, that, that is like, like, I remember that time somebody was telling me that in Kenmai, the two sisters were taking care of the cubs and then the male killed like some cubs and then the, the female um, saw that one of the cubs were injured and then she actually killed the, the injured cub and and then people were saying that oh because the cub was injured so she just wanted to 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 not for her, for the cubs to suffer but some people say that oh because the cub was from that guy <laughs> I don't know <laughs> I don't know if it's anything like that but yeah. crazy stuff yeah yeah maybe we need some biologists uh, on the talk to really look at the DNAs and then talk about it sorry I digress too much I love to, no. to think about those those it's just fascinating when you 
understand. Like, like for example, some of I kept on talking about three ninety nine, and uh, I know Susan in the audience and uh, love and a lot of people love three ninety nine. And the reason we love it is, uh, like, and can anybody type in the chat like how old is three ninety nine? Do you know John? I know she's in, well in her mid twenties, but maybe older than that. Yeah, like twenty something years old, and just think about like how fascinating so for bears they when they uh when they are in mature that is when they are like five years old or four years old right uh, when is it? Me, yeah 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 so so if that's the case so let's let's count from the the human scale for five years old is adult so for human is say like 18 years old 20 so it's like maybe multiplied by four i don't know if this is like a logic yeah. but for people who are 26 years old, like for for bear that's 26 years old that is 100 years old in human and she has four cups like in like two three years ago right that is like like can you even imagine how amazing this is so that's why a lot of people just want to go to grand teton to just see this amazing mother and the craziest thing is, sorry, I just got so, so emotional, is that usually, you know, um, when you have cups, uh, sometimes 50% of the cups wouldn't survive the next year because, you know, every you have to take care of the cups during the hibernation, the nutrients, and then like coyotes will get them, wolf will get them, yeah. other bears will get them. But this 100-year-old lady bear, 399, she was able to protect all four cups for all these years. And now the four cups were all in their sub-adult age and they're all healthy. And, and then, you know, sometimes by seeing them and learning about them, you kind of feel like there is still hope in, in life. <laughs> I don't know if I'm too emotional thinking about it. So, um, uh, yeah, but at the same time, I also heard that, you know, everybody wants to see 399 in the cups and, you know, there's also the, uh, the, the issue of uh, too crowd, the, the location being too crowded. So if you go, definitely try to make some space for them so yeah so that they can uh, survive uh okay so uh so now john just walk away so i think uh lydia and i are uh, gonna take care of all the questions so, uh janet uh thank you <laughs> thank you for the information oh thank you janet and uh shana best angle to shoot a bear head left standing uh, does it always depend on where the light is? Um, so, um, so I briefly touched upon the photography. So that's the perfect time you ask the, the question because I actually know how to answer that. Um, okay. So um, for, for bears, uh, if you're doing backlits, then you want the whole profile, like the side view, because then you see the, the snouts and all. But I think uh, if you want like incoming, like uh, eye, eye contact is always good. But some of the people who said, oh, I don't want the bears to look at you uh, because then you are uh, bothering the bear. But in reality, you know, animals, they are very uh, alert of the surroundings. And if you have been photographing a lot of wildlife, they, you know that and they would keep looking everywhere, look, like glancing around. So what you do is you just focus on your viewfinder. And when the bear was looking from the left to the right, there's a moment that the bear is like kind of looking at you, you click the photo and then it's like you have the eye contact, but they were actually looking somewhere further away from you. And, and you know, that is a, a trick. Or maybe when they're walking, grazing on left, and then when they turn to the right, there's a moment when they were like, like really facing you and then you take a photo and then you say, oh, how did you get the bear walking towards you and stuff. And so, so that is that. And um, uh, oh, the light is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you really have to utilize the light to uh, uh, help with some of the distractions because like photographing a bear can be easy, uh, especially in Alaska, uh, because you know um, you can yeah, you can get closer to them. But to get a really good photos, uh, it takes a lot of uh, time and effort and practice, right? So, you have anything to add to that? Well, it familiarity with the area too, so you know when you can put yourself in the position for it. You know, uh -huh. because there are times when you're gonna go, gosh, I wish I was over here, but then you realize it's a steep bank and you can't get down there unless you want to get in the river with them. I mean that's mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so now the final question, I mean, one of the questions seeing the smiling face of people when he brought those people into seeing this beautiful bear in the wilderness and right? It, and it's to me, it's a, it's a great opportunity to uh, share a unique experience with people that uh, perhaps it's their one and only chance to get out 
and see the bears in this in this setting and what we take for granted and that's that's what I use as a reminder what we take for granted what we see on a regular basis and we in Kodiak and in Alaska in general and other places around the country are spoiled by what we see and just taking the time to learn a little about it and have a little fun with it make it fun make some jokes and and you know loosen people up and then just watching people realize that bears have a reputation for a reason but people have a reputation for a reason too. So yeah. if you take the time just to watch bears and what they're doing, you'll get better photos out of it. You will, yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll learn to anticipate just like with anything else. Mm -hmm. That's that's fascinating. And then one thing that strikes my mind is, uh, can you guys even imagine who are still with us? Uh, there's still 90 people here, that's crazy. So <laughs> you guys actually stay two hours and a half with us. So John was telling me, so I asked him, like, so when you are doing bear guiding, um, so what, what you do is, so he is, for example, he will be in Kenmire. Uh, and then, you know, um, some people will be flying in the plane and then land on the beach or whatever, wherever. And then these people will come out and then John we welcome them and bring them to the yeah. bears. And he told me that, guess what? Sometimes when these tourists left, like they flew away, John will be asked to just stay there in the yeah. field to wait for other, other tourists coming by and all. So can you even imagine like you as like one person, stranded in a way in an <laughs> island kind of surrounding by i don't know how many bears you have seen in one sighting in in, in the open we counted 82 the year before last uh -huh. I mean, that's because it was a COVID year and there just uh -huh. wasn't anybody over there but us and it uh -huh. was, it was so, fantastic and yeah fantastic. so the, the plane left and he's the only guy there walking around with all the bears with only his two bears brace i suppose and <laughs> he enjoyed it and he, right <laughs> yes yeah it's a i just pick a little spot where i could just sit and watch and i observe and i i sometimes i take pictures sometimes i don't i know they'll be back in an hour or two uh -huh. um i make the most of it there were some people out there with boats they came uh -huh. over and offered coffee and it was, uh -huh. it, was, it, was it was a very nice experience uh -huh. Lydia and i went over i had the pilot drop us off and then there was one other person who was doing videography a really really nice guy and so uh -huh. it was just us three the other groups left geographic harbor so we had the whole place to ourselves for four and a half hours. Wow. Just, just us. And what a great experience it was. We had 13 bears fishing actively around us and some very large boars. Uh -huh. And just the, just the experience. And uh, I got to watch Lydia come into her own because she had the 850 at that time and with the, the lens on it and just taking the pictures as the bear fished right past us. I took a couple little shots with my iPhone because I have to pay attention to where the bears are. Uh -huh. What a fantastic experience it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember you showed me the, the videos. Right? Yeah, and then and then the pictures of her her face that I captured that shot of her face when she turned around when I asked her how it was and just seeing her smile and I said, that's a good day at the office because um, you taught somebody about if you relax and you just take it all in and the experience you're going to get, you know, don't keep looking at the back of your camera, look at what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is, that is fascinating. Yes. <laughs> um, so does, does Lydia have anything to add? <laughs> on, um, she's, she's sitting here taking it all in. Yeah, so Lydia here, I have met her and she's so good at like finding bears and and and, and the, the bear knowledge was actually on par with John, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. The thing is um, understanding the situation mm -hmm. is the most important. So, for instance, in like um, morning, you know, middle time, um, you 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 kind of know when the bear is gonna come out. Mm -hmm. The time is really important too. Yeah, I see. Yeah, she looks at. She's a she's a painter, so she gets the light part really easy. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I always like um, this like combination of different arts like, and then you, you create something really interesting. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lydia. Yeah. But so nice to see you. So we have a few more questions. Let's let's go for that. OK, so um, I, uh, Jared asks, have any tips on exposure compensation and metering for grizzlies and black bears, especially with uh, high contrast scenarios in silver tip grizzlies and um, snowy condition? You want to answer? Do you want do you want, want me to answer? I'll, I'll divert to you. Um... Mm -hmm. um, so for for black bears, um, you don't um, 
So what you do is I would, what I would do is I would use manual and then um, uh, expose on some mid tones area like like the trees or the rocks and stuff to get the exposure instead of um, like because the the bear the black bear is black and you you can't just like spot meter on the black bear because some of the black bears are kind of cinnamon color some of them lighter some of them darker so <laughs> very, very variation so it's much better uh, to do manual exposure for for black bears and um, and and make sure that you have your uh, the highlights alert on so if you have um, over Blown over like high overexposed highlights. You you see that the the the, the, the you find that like the LCD have blink keys on, and then you just uh, lower uh, lower that one. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there there is a lot of info, uh, Jared, uh, on the on the exposure, but uh, but that would be uh, it. And then for snowy, uh, again, you just expose on the snow, and that that idea will come from uh, Charles Glasser. He you just expose spot meter exposed to the snow, and then add a two third of a stop in, and then just set it as manual. And then uh, the the snow will not be overexposed, and then everything else will also be in perfect exposure. Um, yeah, I actually have some uh, uh, free uh, uh, webinar on metering, and I think that can also apply to black bear. I think it's uh, timandy.com slash metering one. Um, but uh, I'll just send it out in the emails too, in case any, anybody want to learn more about metering, because yeah, that would take up probably 10 hours. And I am like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but thanks for your question. Very, very good thing though, because you are aware of the, a lot of, the, the, a lot of, the time we actually forget that they catch the light on the on the tip of the fur, and then if you got it overexposed, you lose all the details, and the photo will like will be a lot like, like not good. So so that is very important to pay attention to that. So Jenna, so if you just go hiking and not necessarily looking for bears, you wouldn't bring your dog. No, I I, I if you're going out hiking and your dog's on a leash, it's probably fine. If you're in bear country, just be aware of the risk. I mean. It, mm -hmm. it, just don't let, don't let them run along and bring a, yeah, bring a bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, otherwise you might have an extra dog, a forest puppy to bring back home with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, um, I think um, it also depends on where you hike, right? For example, when we were in Anchorage on that trail, there's yeah. a lot of bear sightings, then you you know it, right? And, and, re and remember in the morning, we heard the coyotes calling mm -hmm. out too when we were out there in the early morning. Oh, really? I, I completely forgot. You guys are just yeah. so aware. So just to let you guys have an idea, I, I'm like, like compare with their experience in the in the trail. Mine is that I'm like a total city slicker. As I, I'm walking there, I didn't hear anything. I didn't smell anything. I didn't see anything. And for them, they are like uh, going into a forensic scene. <laughs> Oh, there is a bear who was sleeping here, and then he walked past this one, and then oh, he he looked up in this one, and then he scratched the tree branch, and then he walked away. This so we should be okay to walk there, but then five minutes later they will come back out here. Like, what, what we showed you, we showed you some bear beds, and the and uh, it's it's just that uh, being aware of the area. But congratulations to you for making it through eighteen miles in that weekend with us. That was quite a hike, hiking weekend. That was pretty good. Yeah, that was that was good. And then yeah, you you see everything on, on that. And I think, God, like I I just have the feeling that if people didn't know about this, um, they can get themselves into uh, uh, trouble. And uh, but then it's very difficult to just teach them without showing them in the field. Like what is like what is this bad, right? What is uh, the trail? What is the hair? This scratch. I remember Lydia was telling me, oh look at this uh, scratch mark on the tree branch. And I would just walk right past by. And for them who have experience, they know what they're looking at. It's just like me talking about photography, right? I look at the lines, I look at the background, I look at where the light is coming from, and it becomes like a, a an instinct. And for them, like in the field, they, they know exactly where to back up, where not to go, and 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 they, they know, okay, we, we should back up. Like let, let's just leave this place, right? That 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 is fascinating to me. Yeah. That was a fun, that was a fun weekend though. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so Kenneth, what is the best time you photograph bear with cups in Alaska, like Lake Clark? Um, do you want me to say a few words before? So um, what, what, so, um, so cups uh, for, um, 
to me, for in the photography world, there there, there are uh, uh, three different kinds of cups. One is called the spring cups. <laughs> spring cups is the cups that was born that spring. So they are the newly born cups, not newly born, but they born in the same year. So they 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 are super cute, you know, like this uh, teddy bears. They have like this uh, V shape. Usually they have this V shape, like like a like a handkerchief, right? Thing like the, we call that the natal natal color, yeah. Natal color, and uh, so those are the spring cups. And then if they survive one hibernation, one winter, then they become a yearling cup. And the yearling cup is the cup that you, you very similar to what you see in Costco when they sell this stuff animal, like little cup. They 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 look like a bear. Like the spring cups is just, just they're so cute. They don't even look like a bear. <laughs> and then the yearling cup. And then and then in two or three years they become a bigger cup. So I assume that Ken, if you are talking about where do you photograph the spring cups, right? So for spring cups, um, I think the best time is late June and early July uh, when the mother first bring them out um, to uh, to the field. But however, the, the thing is, uh, bears are all, like like any wildlife. Their behavior their behavior is not straight. Like some of them, the mom is very skittish. So like if unfortunately they get scared, they will just go into the forest for the whole summer. They never come out. So maybe you only have like this one encounter. But like a few years ago, uh, I went uh, to Lake Clark and I was fortunate to see a mother with two cups and she was very comfortable with humans and she sp stayed like the whole summer there and then you get uh, photos they, they, like, like I, what I heard is they, they stay for for a long time and um, and then some of the end some of the cups when you see them they, they also would retrieve because they are not comfortable and so what I say to you is it's not easy to photograph uh, spring cups and when you see them just take as many photos you can without disturbing them. That's my my thing. And and so there, John, what do you say? Uh, the same. Um, late June seems to be when they're active. We have had them out during the few years ago when we had the humpback whale. We did have them out earlier because the, the food brought them in quick and we were surprised how early in June they were out. Yeah. Um, and then they were out. They were around all the way up through uh, August, you know, uh -huh. they just, but that was an unusual year. It wasn't the typical year because they had a fantastic food source, which attracted a lot of bears. I see. And then, uh, the, the cubs usually follow the mom for two or three years. Is that usually, but, uh, as you find is like with people, the, some moms just, uh, you know, tough love. Hey, I'll give them a year and a half. I'm kicking them out. I mean, if we watched last, was it last season and the season before we watched a lot of bears suddenly realized they'd been kicked out because they're out grazing with mom, mom's getting a little further away, and then a little further away, and then mom's gone. Mm -hmm. And they felt just standing there. We were, we kind of laughed at it because it was when they realized that their mom wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And then they went, they saw their mom, and they were calling out for her, running towards her, and she came after them and pushed them back. She was, that separation time happened, watching them being kicked out. Uh -huh. Wow. It wow. was a... Uh, an interesting dynamic and when the cubs discover that they've been kicked out uh, there was there was two groups of uh of uh, there was one with two and and there was two with three mm -hmm. and they kind of watched to see what the people were doing because they they had nothing else to go towards so they were just kind of watching what we were doing they they would stay in the same area they wouldn't venture out because they probably were afraid of the other bears mm -hmm. wow yeah they they have a very tough um life right when they're on their own i see that sometimes the sisters and brothers they will still stick with each other for for a while after the mom yeah. picked them out yeah, yeah. We've, we've seen that too yeah quite fascinating yeah yeah so okay so things you, things you learn from watching them after a while mm -hmm. yeah so so it's just yeah amazing to watch them uh adriana can you bring bear spray on uh, alaska ferry system yeah that i don't you, know you you cannot bring it into the public areas i actually uh, pull that up to verify. You can't bring it into the public areas, but if it's, I think, locked in your vehicle, you should be okay. But I'm reading the, the page here on my tablet as we're doing this, and it said it is prohibited. Uh huh. Yeah. In public in public areas. That's that's kind of I think uh, something got to be done because um, you know people want to be careful and they bring the bear spray, but then you can't bring it to the ferry. You can't bring it to the small plane. <laughs> bring it to there. And it, so, just, it just says public areas. So, so uh, if you have it in your vehicle, I think uh, you would be okay because it says 
the following items are prohibited in public areas on the vessel. So you can't carry it around with you on that or leave it in your luggage in your room, but you can uh, probably lock it in your vehicle if you're on the ferry system. I see, I see. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's awesome. Okay, uh, I think we, all, we have answered all the questions, John. And uh, are there any comments that uh, you're good? Did I, did we, let me see, did we talk about everything? Do you guys, so you guys don't have any other questions, right? So we talk about, so just a summary, right? So today we talk about um, different bears, like Kodiak bear, Inland bear, um, and um, like Katmai, Lake Clark, uh, and the, the difference in behavior and why it is, uh, what, all the bears are different, so you just have to pay attention to the behavior all the time. Um, and I talk about how John and Lydia, like they, 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 uh, they are very different when they are in in the inland versus uh, hiking in the inland versus in the coastal uh, area. So that that tells you something. <laughs> and um, and then we talk about the bear spray. Um, we talk about uh, like sometimes uh, you walk onto the cache on the, yeah. on the carcass. One thing while you're fresh on that, you had mentioned we're very different. Uh, I didn't touch on it. I, I maybe because I'm I'm still tired from my trip, but. The, the thing I stress all the time when we're out, and it's the same, th same thing in my work as it is when I'm out with bears, mm -hmm. situational awareness is critical and yeah. paying attention. So what you what you saw with us at that time is something I've been teaching Lydia is each situation requires a different level of awareness. Mm -hmm. And when you're in an area highly trafficked with uh, grizz that don't have the, the food source and the black bears were very active at that time, I take it up a notch to be to just make sure that we don't walk right into one, mm -hmm. and, and you know at any time because that's a heavily wooded area we could have walked mm -hmm. right up. There. Yeah, and then also I don't want to have people have the wrong impression that oh I better bring two bear spray and when the bear is say a hundred yards away I just spray first because you well, also have to yeah go ahead. But in in to clarify that like, I, I should have been a little more specific because I'm out there all day long that's why I carry a second one just in case. I have to loan it to somebody or if one malfunctions, should I ever have to use it? Yeah, yeah. And if, we, if he had to use one of the spray and he still have another one for safety for later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like if there's empty, like yeah. this one is actually empty. Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. You yeah. know, maybe maybe it, uh, maybe the propellant that propels the, uh, yeah. the actual pepper doesn't work. Uh -huh. I guess I could throw it at them and bounce it off their nose, but that probably would just make them matter. But uh, yeah, I don't. I I wouldn't want to get into that situation. And, uh -huh. and as a guide, you're responsible for the safety uh -huh. of everybody out there. So you have to make sure that you have a deterrent with you. Uh -huh. Yeah, and don't just use it all the time because think about the impact. If a mother is having these little cups and she's always under danger of other male, and if the situation is not necessary for you to use the bear spray, don't just spray them and then because you, you know the impacts for them they might not be able to like they will be very agitated and um, and they may take some time to recover from it right so you don't you, you just have to like learn more about not to use it use it just as yeah, the last resort right exactly and and just being aware of the bear and paying attention to the the, the signs that they give you the bear's gonna um in a lot of cases, they're easier to read than people. They're, mm -hmm. they, will, yeah. they will let you know when they're uncomfortable. If they're irritated, everybody thinks they're yawning because they're tired. They're yawning because they're not feeling comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, yeah. Those are things we look at. Um, mm -hmm. Certain ac actions that they do before they do a bluff charge or a charge. Yeah. So those are things we look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for some of you have, um, um, like, uh, there, there are some experienced uh, people here, like for example, John is from Kenai Peninsula, how beautiful that place is, I remember. And then uh, Joseph said, if you lose one, you still have another one. Yeah, sometimes you hike, yeah. you, you know, you drop it. And usually things happen in those situations, you know about life. And uh, yeah, so I, I mean, um, a few things that I want you guys to know is uh, like, like what John mentioned about the situational awareness is the most important thing. 
thing. Just be like, like you're not going into hiking. Just say I'm gonna relax and I'm gonna listen play like, fancy noise canceling earphone and then walk in the wilderness. Like, be one with nature. No, no. Like when you go into bear country, you actually yeah. learn to actually hear the hear hear things. I think Lydia is very good at that. Um, learn to hear something that you never hear. Smell, breathe in, and and see if you can tell. And just all the feeling, like let let it let it free and and feel it. And that's very important also for personal healing too. And but like so, the awareness. And second thing is. Um, um, don't be afraid to go to bed, but make sure to like, like I hope you learned something from, from John today with uh, all the experience on that. And, um, and I still highly recommend you guys to try to go to these places to photograph them and, um, and check out the remembering bears. Uh, uh, I have the website here. Let me, let me just, uh, copy. Where's that? Uh, remembering bear. okay here uh the link here uh i don't have the photo contest link though um but just i, I to... think the photo contest actually um they had they had a thing for the other submissions i think it expired sometime today uh, oh know, it's already expired i think as of today yeah okay i see i see so um yeah so i think yeah <laughs> it's too late um um okay cool and then um yeah, so and then, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, John and I are thinking about some tours actually is more my personal thing is I want to go there with him. And then I thought maybe we can um, create like a tour for someone who also, not only want to take photos, but also want to learn more about about this. this I mean, just fascinating when you, you so for many years, I go to photograph bears and it's oh, I got this nice shots. But then when I started to talk to John more about the behavior and like this interaction and the whole like ecosystem it's like even if you don't get a photo it's like oh my god this is fascinating and this happiness that it brings is just uh really good so i i, I think that that is that is that is the, the the point and i'll send you guys a link on onto that one uh yeah okay cool so um lydia and john anything to add um the the main thing i would say is no matter where you go just have fun and get out and explore just be prepared no matter what type of wildlife you're looking at, you know, learn about the wildlife, learn about their, their seasons and their, uh, their, uh, if they're migratory, where they go, where they, where they stay so that you're not surprised out there when you get out there. And the more you learn about whatever you're uh, pursuing, the better off you're going to be in the long run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, so, okay, I just think about something else. So maybe uh, with this link here, I can send it to here again. So um, if um, you guys have any questions uh, for, for, for John, uh, he's a professional bear guy, uh, you can also use that form to type in your, your questions uh, in the future. And um, and we just want, like, as, as, like John, he's just, he's really he's an awesome person who likes to help and, uh, and submit your questions and if you're interested in any of the upcoming tours let us know we'll see how we can put them together um and um and yeah so thank you so much for attending and uh i hope you guys learn something new and so good to see you john and lydia i uh, can't wait to, as well. to come back to alaska again and then you guys see how how a scientist become like like also the <laughs> guiding and it's just in, like the life is very interesting here all right so uh, robert good to see you lee janice everybody thank you so much and so the recording will uh, i will i'll probably post a link uh, to that after the all the processing and editing and stuff and again thank thank you once again john and lydia thank thank you so much for your thank time thank you Tim, man thank you everybody for uh attending today it was a lot of fun hopefully yes. you learned something yeah see you later and I'll, I'll touch touch base with you john offline and uh yeah see you guys so all right see you see you thank you thank you all right okay wow <laughs> yeah okay cool